I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Sir Hilary Beckles. In fact, this Black Futures Forum comes to you based on the conceptualization between the Institute of Caribbean Studies and the Office of the Vice Chancellor. Key to the um, conceptualization, therefore, is Sir Hilary Beckles himself. Sir Hilary Beckles is a Barbadian historian. He is the chair of the Caribbean Reparations Commission and has been a stalwart in the movement for the recognition of the need for reparations in the Caribbean and beyond. Obtaining his PhD in history at the University of Hull, Sir Hilary Beckles has been involved in Caribbean cricket. He has been involved in the shaping of the histor his history curriculum in the, in the region and has been a tower of strength in the development of the university, both as an activist university and as an ethical one. Indeed, the Black Futures conversation is very much dear to the hearts of historians like himself. And so we are pleased that he has taken time out of his busy schedule to come and give opening remarks here for us all. Over to you, Sir Hilary. What a tremendous honor and privilege it is to bring greetings to this gathering of colleagues and, and scholars to discuss matters relevant to black futures. This is a seminal seminar. And to welcome you also to the University of the West Indies that is proud uh, to host and to participate fully in this, in this conversation. The role of universities at this moment is to bring a sense of interrogation and closure to some of the conversations that were indeed created, matured, and disseminated by universities. The world that we are gathering to discuss today, the historical world of global colonization, of imperial structures using instruments such as the chattel enslavement of African peoples, the genocide of native indigenous communities, the centering of women as carriers of the status of slavery. All of these conversations and their legacies found intellectual formulation within universities. Indeed, the universities of the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries played a critical role in the establishment of these crimes against humanity. Universities provided the ideologies of white supremacy. Universities provided the pedagogy of race. Universities provided the economics and the political science and the biology and the law and the theology that enable colonization to function as an extractive device. The world that has poisoned humanity in terms of the creation of this toxic we call racism, that world was formulated in the classrooms and the lecture theaters of some of the most respected universities in the world. The Caribbean is at the center of this. Indeed, the Caribbean can be described as the first site of these intellectual conversations. This is the world into which Christopher Columbus entered. This is a world that evolved out of those Atlantic journeys. Indeed, if one reflects upon the writings of John Locke, John Locke we acknowledge as one of the most celebrated political philosophers of the 17th century world. His work on liberty and freedom are considered seminal texts. But John Locke was also a slave owner in the Caribbean. John Locke was also the corporate secretary of the Royal African Company, which had a remit to supply 6,000 enslaved Africans to the English colonies each year. 
when John Locke was asked, how was it possible to theorize liberty and freedom and to establish a philosophy around those concepts, his argument was that being a slave owner was not contradictory because the African peoples are outside of the parameters of the humanity that my work sought to address. So the Caribbean is part of that first sight. It was in the Caribbean again that the English of all the European nations was able to formulate the concept and have it embedded in law that African peoples are not human, that they are a species of property, real estate and chattel that was established in British jurisprudence. And from the Caribbean, that concept migrated to North America and to other parts of the hemisphere. It was in the Caribbean that instructions were given to decimate the native indigenous population because they stood in the way of the sugar plantations, because they stood in the way of the colonization of the region. It was in the Caribbean also that we have the first legislation that shows that black women were designed as the carriers of slavery. The laws were explicit. A child took the status at birth from its mother. If the mother was an enslaved woman, then the child was born into slavery, which meant that a white woman could not give birth to a slave child, even if the father was a slave. So these gender issues must also be discussed because whiteness as we know it was first formulated as a concept to protect the white woman from her relationships to a slave society. And of course, in Haiti, the Caribbean made the courageous attempt to turn this world upon its head. That it was in Haiti that the concept of universal liberty, of freedom for all, of equality for all, irrespective of the historical and ethnic backgrounds, that was the principle that was first established in this hemisphere. Haiti, of course, has paid a very dear price for seeking to turn the world of the imperial upon its head. It is our duty now to participate in the discourse to reinforce the messages of the Haitian example. It is for us to deconstruct all of these discourses and to understand them to be remnants and legacies of a decayed and corrupted world. Our Caribbean world, like the diasporas around us, are filled with monuments to white supremacy. Indeed, the Caribbean displays more symbols of white supremacy per capita and per square mile than maybe any other country in the world. The Caribbean is now turning its attention to cleaning up its environment in respect of this mess which we call the colonial heritage. The Black Lives Matters movement is serving as an enormous broom that is brushing away the debris. There is no carpet on this planet large enough to cover and conceal this colonial debris. The Black Lives Matters movement is indeed a house cleaning movement. It is a movement designed and focused upon the destruction of the psychological aspects and the material aspects of this history through which the black and native peoples of the world have been forced into through systems we call plantations. These plantations were indeed methods of extraction of wealth using white supremacy as their ideological strategy. There's much work then to be done in this conference. This conference, therefore, should be a marker along the way, a long journey ahead of us to turn the world 
right way up. This is the function of academia. This is the role of the university. And the University of the West Indies, especially, is an activist university within this conversation. Let us play our role in undoing the damage that has been done to humanity by universities these past hundreds of years. I wish for everyone a productive and enjoyable seminar. Thank you. It seemed that as we sought as a university to lift our Caribbean region out of the impact of a pandemic, we were faced with another pressing and recurring issue confronting us as peoples of African descent, the Black Lives Matter protests. The reality is that when Time Magazine declared 2013 the year of the protester, it was inadvertently signaling the maturity and efficacy, as well as the resurgence of various forms of protest, especially mass protest. Prior to and since 2013, we have seen the Occupy movement, the Women's March, the Me Too movement, Roads Must Fall, and again, today, the Black Lives Matter protests. The gruesome murder, indeed the live assassination of George Floyd in front of our eyes sparked protests and has become such a symbol of our frustrations and oppressions, but also of our hope, the hope of our freedom fighters and our ancestors. I'm Sonia Stanley Nayo, Director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies and the Reggae Studies Unit at the University of the West Sydney's Mona Campus and Senior Lecturer in Cultural Studies. I am your moderator for this uh, session entitled Black Futures, Equal Rights and the Call to Dismantle Systemic Racisms. I'm pleased to be hosting this event, one which my colleagues and I in the Institute of Caribbean Studies were immediately compelled to host. I have been heartened, more importantly, by our university's response to the unfolding global anti-racism protests, in particular Vice Chancellor Beckel's responses in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. In keeping with our strategic plan, our mission, and commitment to being an activist and an ethical university, we continue to provide leadership for national and global futures. The struggle is indeed also a Caribbean struggle. And with this clarity, the Institute of Caribbean Studies, in conjunction with the Office of the Vice Chancellor, decided to host this global forum with voices focused around the protests and of course dismantling systemic racisms. Systemic racism is a morass, a wicked quagmire that continues to stifle the breath of life from many of us. In this forum we choose to shed light not only on the past however but also the future, our own responsibility as an institution of higher education for generations to come. I feel strongly that we must continue to engage with and beyond the message from our Vice Chancellor in respect of this moment. As hundreds of thousands around the world stand in solidarity with the scourge of racism, we have already seen glo the global momentum leading to the new charges, the policy directions, removal of key symbols of racism in Bristol and, and in Virginia, and emerging forms of leadership. This global forum continues to center the Caribbean as a space for resistance, a space for advocacy and deconstruction of the history of enslavement, colonialism, racism, and anti-racism movements, including through our very own music. With the Caribbean being central to the invention of the industrial slave complex and racism, this global forum is a signal that we take anti-racism struggles seriously and are closely examining the ways we as an intellectual community must respond for the benefit of generations of students and their families to come. So the project of dismantling histories of enslavement, systemic oppression and exploitation continues and this forum is intended as a focus on global action made urgent by the ongoing protests while being a call to action. We say equal rights after Peter Tosh and that requires action. We bring you today 11 speakers from across the globe, academics, public intellectuals, activists, who span history, music, 
media studies, international development, criminology, psychology, indigenous knowledge, political and critical theory, as well as science advocacy. We explore three major sub-themes around representations of race relations in a global context. Civil rights, justice, and the end of the prison industrial complex, and monumental shifts. Challenging history, deconstructing memory, recording new black futures. I now introduce you to Dr. Victoria Grieve Williams. Professor Grieve Williams is a Warame an Aboriginal Australian historian who has published on Aboriginal family history, slavery, activism, and the history wars in Australia. She works in, inter in interdisciplinary ways to progress the development of indigenous knowledges, positioning Aboriginal spirituality, philosophy as the baseline for this development with a focus on establishing the values and ethics inherent in what it means to be human in a changing world. She has published critiques of public policy for Aboriginal people, identifying homo sacer in Aboriginal camps and amongst displaced Aboriginal people, and has thus argued for Aboriginal sovereignty in a newly constituted republic. Victoria is in the process of establishing a Healing Histories Foundation in which she will apply the Aboriginal principles of healing the wounds of history through truth-telling from research and reuniting families separated by the vagaries of war. Over to you, Victoria. Why am I from the mid-north coast of New South Wales, Australia? My mother's country. And I also have Aboriginal family on my father's side that's from Tasmania. So I'm a living embodiment of the way in which Aboriginal history has progressed in Australia with um, mixed race and um, generations of trauma on both sides of my family. I'm very honoured to be here today to talk to you about SOS Black Australia, Aboriginal resistance to settler colonial racism in the Pacific diaspora. This month, one of our Aboriginal members of parliament Senator Malandiri McCarthy, a senator for the Northern Territory in the Australian Federal Parliament, read the names of those Aboriginal people who have died in custody. Malandiri is one of a handful of Aboriginal members of Parliament. They are representing their jurisdictions like any other member of Parliament. They don't have a special role in the governance of Aboriginal people in Australia. However, their expertise is invaluable when it's used. We still have a huge problem with a lack of proper settlement for Aboriginal people in Australia. And more than that, as I'll go on to say, we have a problem with Aboriginal people being in a state of exception to the Australian modern democracy. Uh, Senator Malandiri McCarthy was talking about the dreadful problem we have of Aboriginal deaths in custody. In 1991, the, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody uh, gave its findings after investigating 99 deaths of Aboriginal people in custody. As a result of that, there were no charges laid. Uh, there was no um, uh, criminal behaviour detected by that Royal Commission. Uh, since then, 437 Aboriginal people have died in custody. And I'm talking here about a population that is less than 3% of Australia's uh, total population of about 24 million. Now, with regard to Aboriginal deaths in custody, I'd like to tell you about some of these cases. In 1989, two Australian policemen dressed in blackface at a police barbecue to mock two Aboriginal men who died in custody. They wandered around with nooses on their necks saying, I'm Lloyd Boney and I'm David Dungy. Lloyd Boney had been found deceased hanging by a sock in a police cell 
some 95 minutes after his arrest in 1987. His family and the Aboriginal community and their allies believed he was one of many Aboriginal men murdered by police in similar circumstances. For example, John Pat in 1983, Eddie Murray in 1981, David Gundy too, shot dead in his home in 1989 as a result of a bungled raid by the police special weapons operation squad who were in pursuit of another man, is recognised by the Aboriginal community as a death in police custody. The video evidence of the police blackface mockery was passed on to an ABC reporter and televised in 1993. Later that year, 18-year-old Daniel Yacht died as a result of police violence in Brisbane, Queensland. The evidence of the protests that followed the deaths of these men is hard to find, though there were widespread protests by Aboriginal people. In recent decades, instances of Aboriginal protests and talking back to white power are bound due to, to the widespread take-up of social media by Aboriginal people to publicise the race-hate crimes committed against them. In 2004, large-scale riots occurred in Redfern and on Palm Island due to the deaths in custody of Thomas Hickey and Mulrunch Dumaji, respectively. These riots were unprecedented in Australian history and succeeded in showcasing Aboriginal anger and frustration globally through media attention. Police presence in Redfern had been stepped up in what was perceived as coordinated attempts to clear the inner city suburb of Redfern of Aboriginal people and allow gentrification to occur. 14-year-old Thomas Hickey was riding his bicycle and trailed by police in a pursuit vehicle when he was impaled on top of a high picket fence as a result of being thrown into the air. Mulrunch Dumaji was singing while walking down a street on Palm Island, taken into custody and beaten so badly that he dies as a result of his liver being cleaved in two. On both occasions, the police intensified the riots instead of acting to calm them. In Redfern, they were fighting young Aboriginal men and children. Aboriginal writer Tony Birch published an essay, Who Gives a Fuck About White Society Anymore?, as a response to the Redfern riot and the police role in it. Media commentary was extensive. Mulrunch Dumaji's death has been followed by legal challenges in the courts and a documentary, The Tall Man, as well as global media publicity. The extensive use of new media and new powerful Aboriginal voices entering the media commentary has arguably seen a paradigm shift in Aboriginal media profile over the past two decades. The deaths mentioned above do not include those that have occurred through white vigilante violence, and these have added another dimension to our understanding of violent Aboriginal deaths. There are several examples, recent examples, of course, all of this started in the colonial period with massacres and widespread killing of Aboriginal people. Adopted into a white family in Perth, 18-year-old Warren Braden was murdered by a gang of white youths in 1993 because he was black, unquote. In 2009, Kwemenjai Ryder was kicked to death in the dry Todd riverbed in Alice Springs by a group of white youth who had been driving dangerously near sleeping Aboriginal people and shouting racist insults in the early hours of the morning. In 2016, in Kalgoorlie, Western Australia, 14-year-old Elijah Doherty was fatally wounded when struck by a vehicle that had been pursuing him on a dirt bike at high speed. The circumstances of Elijah's death and the subsequent court hearings were widely publicised and protests were held in every capital city in an attempt to get justice for Elijah. The Black Arm Band a group of Aboriginal musicians formed in response to a Prime Minister saying he had no time for, quote, the black armband view of history. That is the truth-telling of massacres and criminal takeover of Aboriginal lands. The band composed a poignant song for Elijah that is on YouTube. Aboriginal take-up of contemporary media forms 
has lifted protest to be broader, deeper, and more effective. In 2014, Miss Do, a 22 year old Aboriginal woman, called police because of a violation of a domestic violence order by her partner. Police found she had unpaid parking fines and imprisoned her for four days, deliberately ignoring her complaints of feeling unwell, wrongfully assuming she was withdrawing from drugs. She died as a result of infection caused by cracked ribs she previously suffered at the hands of her partner. She died in custody. In 2015, David Dungy died in prison as a result of being forcibly restrained by seriously untrained custodial officers. His inquest was shown a harrowing video of his final moments when he was saying, I can't breathe and spitting blood. In 2017, Tanya Day died of traumatic brain injuries after she was arrested for public drunkenness on a train in central Victoria. CCTV footage shows her arriving at a police station for questioning. She repeatedly asked not to be put in custody. At the inquest into her death in 2019, police insist she was treated with dignity and respect. Her family think otherwise. If by July 2018, news of the predicament of Aboriginal Australians suffering deaths in custody and from vigilante violence had spread effectively around the world, resulting in strong international support. Outside the inquest into David Dungy's death in Sydney, Hank Newsom, president of the Black Lives Matter movement in Greater New York, USA, stood in solidarity with David's family and supporters his arm around the diminutive body of David's mother, Latona Dungy. It's the same story, different soil, he said, in reference to the death of Eric Garner in New York City in 2014. Both men had cried out that they could not breathe when restrained by officers, and their cries, ignored, had died. So how is it that Australia has got to this point? Uh, I want to give you some of the background to how white people got to Australia. Um, Australia was the last of the British colonies and the British certainly learned a lot from their experiences in other places. So uh, they didn't want to do treaty with Aboriginal people and they didn't want to have to go through the problems of um, dealing with an Indigenous population. So they actually uh, called Australia an empty land. It was settled on the doctrine of terra nullius, which means empty land. And this has resulted in the Australian colonial experience being arguably the most genocidal of all the colonial experiences in the world. In fact, hundreds of thousands of Aboriginal people, no exaggeration, died through massacres. Uh, these did not end until the 1930s. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a huge massacre in Central Australia in 1928, and there was another in the Kimberley during the 1930s. Uh, historians have argued that Aboriginal people are not only the Indigenous people of Australia who have lost uh, land and the possibility of any capital base, through the criminal takeover of their lands. But they also occupy a space that is occupied by the black other in the Atlantic world, and that is that of the slave. So Aboriginal people have been slaved on sheep stations, on cattle stations, in domestic situations. Uh, they were actually put out to work uh, by government agencies, and they their wages were kept. So there's been a lot of cases in Australia now of people trying to retrieve their stolen wages. Aboriginal people have suffered uh, all of the racist uh, regimes that have been suffered in other parts of the world, including, as I've explained to you, uh, state and vigilante violence, also social segregation and ostracism. Uh, tellingly, Aboriginal people 
have seen themselves as part of the transnational black power movement and in the 1960s reached out uh, to, to uh, other uh, black power advocates in the world. Um, during the 1960s, they also received a lot of visits from African people and that whole story of what was happening in the United Nations is a very interesting one. African nations became very interested in what was happening in Australia because the Australian government was supporting the South African regime through the United Nations. So uh, the uh, African leaders started to look at closer, uh, have a closer look at what was happening with Aboriginal people and a lot of links were developed in those times. Australia seems to be a long way from everywhere but it's really interesting when you look at the people who were travelling there in the 1960s and 70s. Most notably, the um, black power activist known as Roosevelt Brown from Bermuda, um, who came to call himself Payulu Kamara Kafago, uh, visited Australia in 1969. And as a result, Aboriginal representatives went to the Congress for Aboriginal People in Atlanta in 1970. And uh, black power developed in Australia. Now, um, I want to get back to the predicament of Aboriginal people as it exists today. And of course, all of this is anchored in history. But um, in, um, I think it was 2007, there was a government intervention into the Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory. It was um, an extreme military style takeover of Aboriginal communities. And it was really designed to get access to their land, but it was all about causing uh, um, Aboriginal people to be seen as absolutely dysfunctional and incapable of caring for their own families. Myself, like other people, was absolutely outraged by this uh, uh, development and it made me think very deeply about the relationship of Aboriginal people to the Australian state. At that time, I was looking at the theory of the state of exception uh, by Giorgio Gambon, and I came to understand that Aboriginal people do live in a state of exception to the Australian state. And I developed a schema of seven pillars of Aboriginal exception to the Australian state. Now I'll read these uh, seven pillars. I haven't got time to give you a big explanation of these. In a way, I think they're very self-explanatory. The first, of course, is um, uh, terra nullius. Um, that resulted, you know, the doctrine of an empty land that resulted in 140 years of unrestrained settler colonial vigilante violence and at least 500 massacres across the land uh, of Australia. The second pillar of exception I call the banality of settler colonial racism. That is the banality because it's ordinary everyday disregard and, um, and uh, you know, ongoing segregation, exclusion of people, ostracism, um, remarks about race and racial difference that underline Aboriginal disadvantage. The third, the removal of Aboriginal children from their families. Uh, this has been a, a a practice during the colonial years when children were abducted to be trained up as slaves in white houses. Um, the settlers used to go out on raids, raid Aboriginal groups and steal their children. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, this function was taken over by the state uh, so that between 1908 and 1918, every state and territory uh, developed in what was called an Aboriginal Protection Board. Uh, they took children from their families. They indentured them, which is a word used uh, from the um, slavery 
days um, and they put them out to work for white settlers. Um, the, uh, another pillar of Aboriginal exception to the Australian state is the fact that 27% um, of a less than 3% population are currently in prison. In the Northern Territory, 84% of the prison population is Aboriginal. Uh, between 2000 and 2010, there was an increase of 50% of Aboriginal prisoners compared with 3% of the general population. The Aboriginal Australia is overwhelmingly criminalised and incarcerated. Uh, number five is the imaginary moral centre of settler colonialism. What we get is a barrage of, you know, put it simply, how perfect white people are and how bad Aboriginal people are. So there's this idea that Aboriginal people have no morality, that all the morality will flow from white people. And uh, number six, the cunning of citizenship for Aboriginal people. There was a referendum in 1967 that was supposed to give citizenship rights to Aboriginal people. A lot of Aboriginal people uh, are not on the electoral roll, either because politically they don't agree with it, because they know it makes no difference, or because the police use the electoral roll to find people who they've got warrants for. When you're an Aboriginal person in Australia, a warrant for your arrest is particularly easy to get. And uh, um, Aboriginal people do not have any impact on the workings of the Australian state, the modern democracy. But this is because I think we live in a state of exception to that. But the reality is that the state exists for the settler colonials. It exists because Aboriginal people are in a state of exception with no morality, no humanity, and existing on bare life. Number seven is the lack of respect and regard for Aboriginal ways of being in Australia. And, um, you know, Aboriginal culture is most often parodied or it's used and abused. Everybody wants to own Aboriginal art, but the artists themselves live in degraded poverty um, and are working often, you know, 20 hours out of the 24-hour day in order to satisfy the requirements of the people who are getting them to produce this art. So, and, and while uh, Aboriginal culture is the thing that interests most people in the world about Australia, uh, there's still no real Aboriginal cultural heritage strategy whereby Aboriginal people manage their own cultural heritage. This is all held by white Australia. It's commodified and it's, you know, brought out on certain occasions. When Aboriginal people want to live their own cultural way, there are things that are always stopping that from happening. So what, what is the solution to all of this? And I think a lot of us are thinking that now. There's so much um, activity, people becoming aware of the um, difficulties that exist for black people around the world and wanting to know what the answers are. In Australia, uh, the question of reparations is, is there, but we are also a people who originally owned our land, originally had land that's all been taken from us. So the, the clarion call was for land rights for so long. That's been extraordinarily difficult. Land rights legislations and the native title have just produced more problems for Aboriginal people and, frankly, more jobs for white people. There is an Aboriginal affairs industry. What I think is the way forward is for there to be a truth-telling uh, process. I think it should be um, a praxis, a new way of being, a new way of living in Australia where the truth means everything. This needs to happen at a local and regional level, perhaps after the style of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal people in Canada, which I believe has gone a long way towards solving some of the problems 
of a lack of economic base for uh, Canadian Native people, slowly but thoroughly and carefully. Uh, this is the kind of thing we need in Australia. People are talking about treaty. I'm not sure about treaty. I think we need to explore all of that thoroughly through something like this Royal Commission, which in Aboriginal terms is called a Makarata. It is a process of coming together after conflict. It is a way of getting the truth out, of people coming to terms with that and finding a way forward together. My personal preference is for a new republic. I believe the constitution of Australia is problematic. The constitution of Australia was developed at the high point of racism in Australia in 1901, when the new parliament's first legislation was a white Australia policy that saw the repatriation of the South Sea Islander people who had been brought to Australia to slave in the sugarcane fields of Queensland. And this, of course, is another Australian story of slavery. Um, I think my time is up. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for listening to me. Dr. Bolo Ibanda de Beberi is a full professor of communication and cultural studies and the founding director of the audiovisual lab for the study of cultures and societies at the University of Ottawa. He's going to speak to us on the topic, we are not your guinea pigs, black social media response on French doctors COVID-19 controversy. Thank you very much indeed for putting this panel together, Sonia, and for including me to share some of my thoughts with you guys. Although we're doing this virtually, and that this is probably a kind of new norms from our capitalist system and mentality, I would like to acknowledge that I am talking to you from the unceded ancestral territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people here in Ottawa, where I reside. For me, this is more than the politics of recognition. It is the empathetic ways for me to understand most colonial experiences and to know what some colonial subjects such as myself feel, including the Aboriginal people in Canada. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission which now is become like a fashion of acknowledging the territory, is not just lip servicing from Buru's Ibanda's uh, mouth. It's a real feeling that I'm sharing right now. So the title of my presentation is, We Are Not Your Guinea Pigs, Black Rappropriation and of the Whitenessing and I use the term whiteness in COVID-19 discourse purposely. Maybe if we have a little bit time at the end, I can elaborate more on the two concepts in their, and their theoretical implication in this work, namely the concept of rappropriation and that of whiteness. In. Or in French, you may say blanchir. <laughs> Whitening your is whiteness is a little bit more complex because there is a procedure of naturalization in white in the process of whiteness. But maybe let me place this two footnote by saying that reappropriation is a concept I use a lot. I coined it following the Belgian French regionalism, which essentially means to take back something that belonged to you and to clean it up of any dirt. And the notion of whitening, as I said, or whiteness, as I said, is that which allow one always naturally in most dominant discourse to be there but try, try, by trying to be invisible. Some people call it whitewashing but it's different. 
For example, when we clap for healthcare workers in West in the Western hemispheres, and especially in some European immigrants countries, we clap most of the time for the white nurse and doctor who are, who are also dominantly represented in our white media and shown as shown in video that uh, Gina Rashiri com, uh, commended um, presented last time when she was so wondering what kind of erasure, the erasure of, of black people, of people of color, in the image depicting National Health Service workers in the British newspapers. They were all white. So, so whereas we all know that most of the nursing or the nurses and most of the medical doctors are from uh, the former colonies, the former British colonies. But the image that we represented on British newspaper, most British newspaper, were not representative of these people. So these two central notions, reappropriation and whiteness, so briefly introduced, my presentation focused on a contentious news story regarding Black people and the novel coronavirus. Indeed, on April 1st, 2020, meaning this year, on La Chaine Info, LCI, a French newspaper's a French news channel, television channel, multiple French doctors, and I must argue, multiple white French doctors, were having a conversation, a discussion, a scientific discussion, as to what would be the best protocol, the best way to study effective treatment against the COVID-19 pandemic. In one of the segments, and this is a segment I will be focusing on on my, on my presentation, two particular well-respected scientists, Jean-Paul Mirab, head of the resuscitation department of Hospital Cochin, and Camille Locke, research director of a wonderful tier one research institute in France, were having this conversation. And now I quote, this is Mira's talking. If I can be provocative, shouldn't we do this study in Africa where there are no masks, no treatment, no resuscitation? A bit like it was done incidentally for certain aid studies on prostitutes, where we tried things on them because we know that they do. They're highly exposed. They don't protect themselves. Do you? What do you think? And then Locke was answered. Well, you are right. And for that matter, we are in the process of thinking about a parallel study in Africa, actually, with the same approach for the BCG, the placebo. I think that a call for proposal for proposal has been released and we all will be released. I think we will, in fact, seriously ponder on that. This doesn't prevent thinking about the parallel study in Europe and Australia. And then Mira concludes, of course. So you can find this uh, segment is still online on YouTube, and I have sent some of the links to to Sonia for those of you who are willing to see what I'm talking about. However, these comments were met with swift swift backlash and spark worldwide debate in various languages, including condemnation from many, many African stars, from sports um, um, stars to movies, to all over to singers, etc. And two significant um, uh, um, intervention could be cited here. 
Number one, SOS racism, a French anti anti racism association, filed a complaint to France broadcast, broadcast ethics watchdog and media regulator, the Conseil Supérieur de l'Audiovisuel, and a lawyers association in Morocco also said it will file a formal complaint with the French prosecutor against Myra. In turn, the French National Institute Research Institute looks works for released a statement on Twitter claiming the outcries was fake news, that the clip was truncated, and that clinical trials are also occurring in the Netherlands, Germany, France, Spain, and Australia. Though it appears LCI, the, move, uh, the television channel, removed the clip from their online account and reposted five minute version of the segment and a reposted five minute version of the segment could be found on YouTube by doing a simple search, vaccine BCG 2020. Following the backlash, however, from the initial statement issued by, issued by, um, Issue a follow up, insert um, issue a follow up apology on Twitter, stating that Lux, Lux understands the emotion provoked by his lack of reaction and that the condition under which he was interviewed did not allow him to react correctly, though he insists he did not make any racist comments or comments or emails. In a statement released by his employer, Myra expressed that he wanted to present his apology to those who were hurt, shocked, and felt insulted by the remark that he cl clumsily expressed on RCI that week. I tried to search to ICI Facebook and Twitter account, but it appears that as of today that I'm speaking to you, this 24 hours news channel has still not issued a statement on the matter. So the end really of this presentation is therefore to assess how members of Black virtual spaces have responded to the comment made by these two French doctors. In other words, by using Stuart Hall's, which is still my own preferred bias uh, media studies analysis, by using Stuart Hall's encoding decoding model. I would like to understand what emerging discourses, practice, and of reappropriation can be observed in the range in the range of readings, the reaction of this black population in this virtual audience. Answering this question opens up new liminal space of analysis and highlights the importance first sight nowadays, nowadays for alternative discursive practices among members of Africa and the African diaspora. Indeed, following these inflammatory comments made in the context of, in the context where Black intellectual voices were missing to speak about themselves, and the very context of social and physical distance of the novel coronary virus, Racialized virtual spaces become not, became not only site of contestation, but also that of education and self-determination. Thus, by mobilizing the social media virtual space as a liminal site of expression, one would observe the ways in which this incident brought to light not only an existing reluctance and mistrust of Western medical intervention among African peoples, 
uh, but uh, uh, amongst the African diaspora as well. And also, what this show is a kind of enduring scientific racial bias and reification of the black body. In addition, this also highlights the fact that these racist commentaries were bro broadcasted with no major repercussion on the news channels located in the former colonial state that forced people from their colony to perform human zoos well into the 30s. But as well as we can argue today, ongoing colonial mentality and practices. So, in my analysis of African representations, especially in cinema or whatever uh, media representation, I use this notion of reappropriation to show the ways in which African take back whatever has been said on them and clean it up, as I explained earlier today. That the notion of reappropriation is about taking back and cleaning up something that has been disturbed, something that the representation, for example. And then I see the similarity here when analyzing what was going on online with that cleaning, taking back and cleaning, cleaning up this use of black body. In the social media liminal space here, Facebook, Twitter, so many groups, they, the, the, uh, uh, they reappropriated these Western tools of control to decolonize the dominant narrative on them. And this is well represented by, and if I use some of the numbers, just to tell you, in the United States, uh, some of the data shows that, show that um, despite making less than 13%, actually 12.7% of the U.S. population. African-American represent 18% of Twitter users, and this is significant. This 5% and plus number of demographic representation of African-American is significant in two particular reasons, for two particular reasons. First, it does provide a space for them to express individual negotiated dissent images against collective abuse, misrepresentation on black bodies in the media and the excessive police violence. And in this particular case, we can see the excessive scientific violence on black bodies. But second, this high, higher number contributes to augmenting the algorithm positioning of black discourse on the web, making it easier to be found and keep it the topic on top of the agenda. So coupled with their social media interaction account and mobile technology, racialized and marginalized population and identity group formation today, capture rapidly circulate image and they are present in this liminal space in, in ways in which that makes the topic black people would like to talk about on the top of search engines. And this can be seen for uh, some of the global outcries that is going on today, especially from the assassination, the live assassination of George Floyd in, by Minneapolis police, and of course, Eric Garner in 2014 or 15. So indeed, the use of hashtag campaign have become influential in challenging dominant discourses. So if I may conclude, nowadays it is widely acknowledged that structure of white supremacy can permeate web, the web, and this we know that. But it is not their exclusive place anymore. Indeed, social media is inherently user-centered, multimodal, and interactive na nature are led to the erosion of the dichotomy between the ordinary versus the extraordinary and the powerless versus the powerful at the core of mass media as we used to study. That's why 
I still do need to bring Stuart Hall back, <laughs> despite the fact that he talked about encoding, decoding back then when this dichotomy relationship was not actually at the point, but it's still so actual today that we see the reverse oppositional happening and uh, within this space, based on the nature of the, this particular social media uh, 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 user-centered modality. So although this power dynamic may still exist, minority can leverage virtual liminal spaces to intervene, as Baba has put it. Indeed, other researchers are also well note, note that we are entering a new era where we can highlight instance, instances of lived experience, dehumanization, and gross negligence in our own world. And this is particular if you if you read white singers. We all, they talk widely about that. This era of cyber diffusion offers not only a range of options for us, racially marginalized people, to express our dissent, but it also encourages a significant rethinking of those very concepts available for understanding these contentions. And that's my end of talk. So if you have any question, you may, I am here listening. Mr. Michael Boremo is a human rights campaigner and the director of the London-based international development organization, Action for Southern Africa, which is a successor to the British anti-apartheid movement. Michael is also the founder of the Diaspora Initiative for Nigeria's Development and is participating in this event in his personal capacity. Michael will engage with the fact that George Floyd's cry, I can't breathe, has resonance for many blacks or people of color in the world. But how does it apply, if at all, to the relationship between the global North and black Africa? And what is the role of solidarity in the struggle for racial justice? I'm pleased to hear you Michael, over to you. I would like to thank Dr. Sonja Nair and the University of West Indies for inviting me to participate in this very timely event. I'll be talking about the iconic phrase, I can't breathe, and its symbolism within the context of the relationship between the global North and Black Africa post-colonialism. I will also be promoting solidarity in the global struggle for racial equality. Now, black people in America, Britain, and many other countries of the global north have for centuries been fighting for their rights, even their right to life. For so long, the, black, uh, the life of the black person, both in terms of our right to live and the quality of the life we do live, has been denied systematically and repeatedly. We watched in total disgust and horror um, but hardly in shock, as uh, Judge Floyd was senselessly murdered in America. It isn't the first time, and we haven't indeed had to wait for long at all to find that it won't be the last time either that a black person's life is needlessly taken by someone with no regret whatsoever for the type of life that Judge Floyd uh, represents. The global reaction to Judge Floyd's death has been different from reaction events like this have evoked in the past. Um, why is this so? Why is it different um, this time? I think that the answer lies in the symbolism of the knee on the neck and in the words, I can't breathe. Um, these are highly symbolic of historical and wider oppression of black people. How the predominantly white countries of the global north have developed and implemented political, social, and economic, economic systems uh, designed to pin black people down in their metaphorical neck and to impede their progress. This, however, isn't a description that only fits what has and is indeed um, happening still to black people living in countries like America and Britain. Um, it is happening to black people everywhere, including in Africa. And um, I want to talk about this. Now, in an article by Boris Johnson, who is the current prime minister of the United Kingdom, published in The Spectator on 2nd February 2002, Mr. Johnson wrote that 
you know, the continent, the African continent that is, may be a blot, but it is not a blot upon our conscience, the British conscience. Um, the problem that is of Africa, um, according to Mr. Boris Johnson, is not that we were once in charge, but that we are not in charge anymore. Disappointingly, there are some, even black Africans, uh, who share this sentiment. And Africa is, the, the, the idea that Africa is wholly to blame for the state of deprivation and underdevelopment that has besieged many of the countries in it for many years. This kind of thinking, while not surprising to have come from Boris Johnson, is highly dangerous in its implied victim blaming and perpetrator absolving stance. Um, this point of view, wittingly or unwittingly, overlooks the reality of how former colonizers institutionalized structurally unequal economic relationships between themselves and their former colonists, ensuring that they can continue to systematically benefit in highly lopsided manner from the extraction of the wealth of those former colonists. Now, there are, of course, many ways in which we can highlight how neocolonialism continues to impede African progress, politically, socially, culturally, but none really represents this phenomenon as starkly as the ongoing economic subjugation of the continent of Africa and the real impact this is having on the realization of economic and social rights of Africans. It is true, of course, um, broadly speaking, that governments of African countries are primarily responsible for respecting, protecting, and fulfilling the economic and social rights of their citizens. But it will be um, extremely disingenuous, I believe, to suggest that rich countries of the global north who mostly participated in or supported the evil of colonialism, apartheid, and slavery are not responsible, at least in part, and I think that's by no means a small part, for the inability of the African continent to achieve meaningful progress in this regard. Last year, in 2019, our organization, Action for Southern Africa, produced a report with title The Money Drain, How Trade Misinvoicing and Unjust Debt um, undermine economic and social rights in Southern Africa. In this report, we highlighted how trade-related related illicit outflows, uh, these are funds that are illegally earned, transferred, or, and or utilized across you know, um, an international border, as well as external government debt payment from the Southern African Development Community region, which includes illegal debts, odious debt, and um, illegitimate debt. In practice, means fewer jobs, teachers, medicines, houses, and other essentials for citizens in this region. This applies, of course, to much of the rest of Black Africa today. On trade-related illicit outflows from Southern Africa alone, based on the latest data, ACTA estimates it amounts to at least 8.8 .8 billion US dollars in 2015 alone. We also calculate that external government debt payment from Southern Africa to be at least 21.1 billion US dollars in 2018 alone. Some of this is money that could have been used to realize economic and social rights of Africans. This debt issue comes into full perspective when you compare treatment of African countries and other countries by financial institutions. Now, related to this economic apartheid of much of Black Africa is the climate debt global South countries also owe Africa. Climate change, of course, is increasing the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events as, uh, such as Cyclone Ida and Kenneth, which we witnessed last year and which uh, wreaked havoc in many parts of Southern Africa, particularly in Mozambique. Remember that it is largely global not countries, not African countries that are responsible for climate change, including, of course, historical and current emissions and current uh, and um, environmental degradation that are linked to the era of um, colonialism. So, yes. It can very easily be shown that global North countries have their metaphorical knee on the neck of Africa for long. They have had it for long. And yes, we have this in common with our brothers and sisters out, or outside of the continent who are pinned down by centuries old systems built to work against them at every single turn. Their fight is our fight and vice versa because the battlefields may deeper. The motivation of those who refuse to see our humanity as black people are essentially the same. For this reason, we must work together. The black person in Africa and the black person in the global north. We have a shared destiny of dignity, justice, and freedom. This calls for unrelenting solidarity.
to provide solidarity, of course, we must understand and appreciate each other's lived experiences, recognizing that even our, in our shared experiences, there are privileges and many intersections we must be willing to acknowledge. We must reject every attempt to divide us. This is sometimes achieved by telling us that the Black people in the global North are responsible for their predicament and not the historic you know, consequence of slavery and systemic racial oppression or that Black people in Africa are responsible for their current state of affairs and not the legacies of colonialism, apartheid, and the injustices of a carefully crafted international order designed to perpetually disadvantage Africa. So finally, um, I was speaking to uh, a friend um, a few days ago, a white person, and he suggested that the Black Lives Matter protests were um, ineffective since it is impossible to change people's hearts. I pointed out that protest movements are not intended to change people's hate-filled hearts. They are to force action to end systemic and institutional racism. A white supremacist is calling a black person the N-word, for example, doesn't affect the black person's ability to be educated and to seek the best education for their kids. It doesn't force them to live in rundown neighborhoods lacking major facilities and infrastructure. It does not plunge and trap them and their future generations into a cycle of crime, imprisonment, and poverty. It does not take away their lives, literally. Systemic and institutional racism does all the above to Black people and more. We have an opportunity now to work for real change in both the global North and in Africa to deliver justice for Black people everywhere. So let's do it. Professor Anthony Bogues is a Asa Mesa Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, Professor of Africana Studies, and Director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. He holds international appointments as a visiting professor, Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg, and Senior Visiting Research Fellow, International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. Might I add, Professor Anthony Bogues was here with us at the Mona campus for many, many years before he migrated to Brown University. We are pleased to welcome you. The title of this uh, brief talk is Black Lives Matter, Abolition and Black Liberation, the political language of Black freedom today. I wish to thank VC Beckles for hosting this forum and for the invitation to say a few brief remarks. I want to thank, to thank Dr. Nair for, all, for the formal invitation and for making sure all the logistics were in place. In these brief remarks, I want to say three things. Firstly, I want to talk a bit about the moment that we are in, the current moment. Secondly, I want to say something about the new political language of the Black Freedom Movement, which has now emerged. And thirdly, and finally, I want to say something about Black internationalism as an explicit global uh, current of struggle that has significance for world politics. So let me begin with the moment, what Stuart Hall might call the possible beginning of a new conjuncture, one which is unfolding, one which is not yet clearly defined, but one which is shaping the politics in which we live in. A politics in which six months ago, we would not have thought that some things were possible. To characterize this moment, it is important, I think, or to characterize the conjuncture, it is important, I think, to pay attention to the following things. Firstly, the COVID pandemic and the ways in which this particular pandemic has exposed the fragility of human life in case we had forgotten that. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly for our purposes, how this pandemic has made clear on the belly of the social system in which Black persons are disproportionately affected and in which Black persons die, not because of some euphemistically called underlying conditions, in quotations, but rather, I would argue, how structural anti-Black racism has created the conditions for, the grounds for, in which Black people and Black life 
is adversely affect, affected. In other words, to think about structural anti-Black racism is to think about, and COVID, is to think about a set of conditions in which Black life cannot breathe. The second context that, that we should think about is perhaps a context in the United States where I'm speaking from, and that is the grassroots campaign of Bernie Sanders and the mobilization of young whites in that campaign, which for the first time in the United States in a long time, put on the agenda of mainstream politics, the idea of democratic socialism. It is an important fact to note, because in part, I think it explains the, the vigorous white, young white support for the Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement. The third context that we should be aware of is the consistent organization of local Black mass protests, particularly since 2014, by the Black Lives Matter movement. This is a unique movement in the history of Black freedom struggles, since it was catalyzed, formed, and founded, and then led by queer Black women and who were also feminists. These three women, Patrice Kellors, Alicia Gar Gar Garcia and Opal, uh, to me, make it very clear that we are into a new form of Black politics. It has meant, with, with, with this kind of formation, that the old patriarchal ways within the Black freedom movement, ways of organizing, ways of leadership, have been disposed of, and that what we have are new forms of organizations which depend on networks and autonomy, and that as they depend on networks and autonomy, they are facilitated by the technology. It is not that the new technologies has created new forms of leadership. It is rather that the new forms of leadership opened up by the Black Lives Matter movement has, has, has really created new forms of organizing itself, which deploy the technologies of social media and other forms of, technologic, of technology. I would suggest, therefore, that these three conditions, and there are many more, obviously, created the grounds for what I think we can now call in this moment a world historic movement. That is, to think of the actual Black Lives Matter movement and this moment as something that is world historic. It is world historic, I would also suggest, for the following reasons. Firstly, that the uprising, and it, is a, and it has been an uprising, has punctured the neoliberal order. It has shaken it, it has not overthrown it, but it has done so in ways I think that has shaken some of the historic foundations of capitalism and of, ne and of neoliberalism. One of those, those foundations is structural anti-Black racism. Anti-Black racism we know is deeply rooted in racial slavery and its legacies in the America. And as such, it structures our everyday lives. But it is also a symbolic order. In other words, anti-Black racism operates both at the level of economic and social, but at the level of the symbolic. And as a symbolic order, it really puts the Black body in a certain position. The Black body is not a human body, and therefore is disposable. When the cop in, in Minneapolis placed a chokehold on George Floyd, he was doing so because he felt that there would be no consequences for him. Because after all, in his eyes, Mr. Floyd was not human. He was just another black disposable body. The protests, the demand that emerged from, these, from the protests around the world was that Mr. Floyd was human, that the black body was not disposable. So the protests have shattered the hegemonic myth of American society, and indeed, I would argue, of world, of world society and the constitution of the modern world, that the black body is disposable, not human. What this protest has done is to say black lives matter, and therefore being black is also being human. The second feature of this particular moment or protest is it, I have first in mind to think about is, a, is about both the demand and removal of the monuments. 
from Mr. Edward Colston, slave trader and owner in Bristol, to Leopold, to King Leopold in Belgium, to the Confederate monuments in the United States of America. We have seen a move to, do, to get rid of these monuments. Monuments are the public memories of the landscapes. They tell the story of, of a nation, its founding and its achievements. The removal of these monuments creates a breach an opening in the dominant historical stories that a country tells itself. It forces the population to confront its history. In the American case, it has to confront the history that America was a slave society. Not a society with slaves, but a slave society. It forces the Belgium to ask itself, how did it become so wealthy with an elite that can now that lives off the actual historical Belgium colonialism conquest in the Congo, a, co a colonialism in which a cutting off of cutting off of the hands of the ordinary Congolese people was a common practice. So to briefly summarize, this is a world historic moment when anti-black racism, one legacy of racial slavery, one level legacy of colonialism is being confronted. I now turn to my second point, the political language of the Black Lives Matter movement and of this moment. Black Lives Matter is not a political or social slogan. It is a political banner. In saying this, I refer the audience to a 1967 speech on black power in London made by CLR James, that most remarkable Caribbean intellectual. James made the point that the difference between a slogan and a banner was that a banner was able to catalyze, James says, the political imagination. The evidence of this catalyzation of the political imagination is clear. It is clear when we look at the Black Lives Matter movement and its chapters around the world. It is clear when we look at the various protests around the world, the solidarities and support of the African, African American struggles. But what is also clear is that there's a way in which solidarity and support operates, pays very great attention to local conditions, whether it is in France, whether it's in Amsterdam, London, or elsewhere. A feature of political banner is not just it galvanizes that the political imagination uh, operates, but that it is also adaptable. So think of the 1960s slogan of Black Power and how that was adapted all over the world, morphing in the South African context into black consciousness and the political activity of Steve Biko. So I submit that Black Lives Matter is a political banner, and a political banner which has stirred the political imagination of the black world. Now I come to my third and final point. From the protests, there has emerged a certain kind of political language, a political language that some of us are not accustomed to, and a political language that I think many in our many people in another generation have not paid attention to. But again, to come back to Sierra James, that one of the things we should do, particularly when people are in motion, he says, is to listen, learn, and listen and learn again. In trying to do, do this as best as one can, it would seem to me that the political language that has emerged from this uprising is that of abolition. Now, the word has a long history in the Black freedom movement, from the Black abolitionist conventions held in London, in the Caribbean, in Europe in the 19th centuries, to the most radical Black abolitionist movement in the, in that we know in the world, which is after the Haitian Revolution. And yes, the Haitian Revolution was a Black abolitionist uh, act. To the black abolitionist figures of people like Douglas, Ida B. Wells, and Sojourner Truth, to the work of people like W. B. Du Bois, who coined the phrase abolition democracy when he was trying to think about what needed to happen after emancipation in the United States, to, in fact, what in most recent times, the ways in which the world has become deployed by people who talk for, uh, or argue for prison abolition and the abolition of the Castro state. And then, very importantly, 
black feminists who have taken a particular position, both about the carceral state and the, uh, and the, and the prison abolition, but also includes in the any more notion of abolition patriarchy. Therefore, I would want to say that black abolition, uh, abolition is, is a capacious political term, and one doesn't have time to, to, to actually deal with it in any detail. However, I would just point to a specific sentence or sentences that emerge from the abolitionist, black abolitionist manifesto. And it says that they want to create a world without police where no one is held in cage and that where all people are treated well. And then the manifesto goes on to talk about questions of accessible housing for people, fully investment in care, a kind of governance of, of, of communities in which there is no hierarchy. So what, is, what I'm trying to point to is that there's a way in which the black abolitionist movement is not just about defunding the police or is about the abolition of the carceral state and or of the prison industrial complex, but it also has a much wider set of political demands, political and social demands, which we need to pay attention to. And that therefore to think about it as, as abolitionism is what they are doing or what the movement is doing is that it is actually drawing from a long tradition of abolitionism. Bear in mind that the question of abolitionism, abolitionism immediately is raised once the business of racial slavery begins. So what, can, what I, do I think we can say in the end? And here I will round up. Firstly, that this, at this particular contemporary moment, the Black liberation movement is embedded inside a long tradition of Black radicalism, which begins with the different processes of Black abolitionism. Secondly, that our support and understanding of this movement and this moment should rest on, our, rest on a certain understanding of this roots, of the roots of this movement, a certain kind of Black internationalism that goes back to the 19th century goes back to the Black conventions, as I said, that occurred in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, and in the Caribbean, that goes back to the 1901 Pan-African Congress held by W.B. Du Bois and Trinidadian Silver Henry Sylvester Clark, that goes to a series of conferences held by Du Bois between, uh, between 1901 to 19, in the 1930s, that then goes back to the mass movement and the achievements of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and the work of Garvey, and particularly the mass movements that he attempted to develop and to create internationally, goes back to the 1945 conference of, in Manchester, headed by Padmore and Kwame Nkrumah, to the nine, back to the 1956 Paris Conference of Black Writers and Artists, in which uh, people from Haiti, people from the Caribbean, let's, let people like George Lamin and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Richard Wright from the United States, as well as Amy Césaire from Martinique, uh, participated, a conference organized by Diop, the, the remarkable intellectual from Senegal, goes back to the, the Black Power movements, of the 1960s, the Southern Freedom Movement of the 19, late 1950s and 60s, to the African National Liberation Movement, goes back to the International African Anti-Apartheid Movement, back to the 1974 Pan-African Conference, conference that was held in Dar es Salaam. In other words, to understand Black Lives Matter as part of a Black, interna Black liberation movement, and, and part of, of, of certain con, uh, trend or current of black internationalism, we have to understand that the black struggle, the international black struggle, to quote Professor Jerry Augusto, an African-American intellectual, we have to understand it as the motion of the notion. To understand that motion of the notion, we then have to understand that the black struggle explodes at various nodal points. And as it explodes at various nodal points in different, different countries, that it creates new political imaginaries and new language. Black Lives Matter is the new radical political imaginary of the Black liberation movement. It creates a new opening. And for that, we must give thanks. Thank you. Dr. Baz Dreisinger is an author, activist, academic, and agitator. She is a personal friend 
She is a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, City University of New York. She is a founder of the Prison to College Pipeline Program and Global Prison to College Movement. She is also the author of Incarceration Nations, A Journey to Justice in Prisons Around the World, as well as the book Near Black, White to Black, Passing in American Culture. Dr. Dreisinger will address what a defund the prisons movement looks like in the immediate and the long term in both a United States of America context as well as the globe. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm, I'm honored by this invitation and excited to talk about Black Futures, the Call to Dismantle Systemic Racism. And it's a title that I'm deeply inspired by. It actually brings to mind Angela Davis's brilliant citing of uh, Du Bois's critique of the abolitionist movement, in which he says that the abolitionists were too busy talking about what they were tearing down uh, and abolishing in order to focus on what they were building. And I think that's such a critical thing to keep in mind at this moment, that it's not about what we're destroying, it's not about what we're ending, um, what we're defunding, but rather what are we funding, what are we building, what are we supporting? And I also, uh, the, the title also makes me think of Martin Luther King's words about what he called the Black Revolution in A Testament of Hope. And he said, it is forcing America to face its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. Uh, it's such a powerful quote, and I think it, although he's talking about America, it's applicable to the world at this moment. This is a moment to reimagine radically, and that's what I wanted to use my uh, minutes today to do, uh, is to radically reimagine. And, and uh, while I'm going to focus on justice for the most part and, and justice systems in the U.S. and globally, I also really wanted to frame the discussion in the context of other imaginations. And some of the things that I am imagining and uh, building in consciousness at this moment are uh, for one, in the global south, a move toward true independence and uh, away from the need to necessarily have tourists uh, support economies, tourists and remittances, but thinking about what independent structures and systems really, really look like. Here in the U.S., I have been writing about and, and pushing for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to deal with the genocides, and I say plural genocide because it's not only slavery, it's also uh, the genocide of Native Americans in this country, and thinking about how we've never dealt with that, and we need a Truth and Reconciliation to deal with that and create reparations for it, and also build a new constitution to replace our outdated, archaic, and frankly racist constitution. Uh, I've been imagining what I call the Frederick Douglass Peacemaking Academy, a, uh, an altogether new form of creating peacemakers in the community that is an alternative to police academies. And it includes uh, work by formerly incarcerated people and credible messengers as faculty members and a visit to the National Memorial uh, in, in Montgomery, Alabama, so that everyone making peace in communities uh, here in the US, but I think this is applicable globally, understands the context of race in, in America, in the world, in, in the post-colonial world. And I think when it comes to justice and thinking about radical imagination and, and our futures, uh, I think about, I imagine a country where there are social services and universal basic income and education so that there's less crime to begin with. There's less that has to be addressed and that has to be dealt with um, along the lines of some of the Nordic countries and a country like Rwanda, where there's radical equality instead of the kind of radical inequality that produces crime all over the world. Uh, I think about 
scenarios or uh, where there's domestic violence or there's beef between gangs and, and, and violence in communities, you have mediators or violence interrupters coming in to address this in a humane way who are, and who are part of the community, not external agencies who are sent in like armed forces. And I think about some of the incredible peacemaking and mediation programs that I've visited in uh, and, and spoken with members of in countries like Malawi, um, in Bangladesh, in Washington, D.C., with Cure the Streets, uh, in New York City, even, um, with various peacemaking initiatives that exist in right here in New York and, and violence interrupters in Chicago. How do we build that out and develop that? in a much more sustained way such that we don't, we can entirely replace the police with that. Uh, I think about and, and imagine a world where there uh, are substances, uh, drugs are legal and where there's misuse of them, you have a team prepared to intervene and help and guide and that includes alcohol. Um, and once, once it's not illegal, it's easier to create such a force. Um, as as with mental illness as well. And I think of a country like Portugal and its harm reduction methods and uh, the ability for there to be community members who intervene where they see problems occurring, where they see misuse occurring. And then finally, in, in a big picture sense, I imagine a community where when, again, when harm occurs or violence occurs, you have community restorative justice centers who can confront the person doing the harm and bring them together with uh, the, the person who has been impacted and determine what real justice looks like as opposed to simply punitive justice that perpetuates a cycle of harm. And so I think about really powerful restorative justice programs around the world, like Common Justice here in New York. I think about the justice centers that Canada is building with a focus on indigenous communities who are deeply overrepresented in justice systems there. Uh, and in the context of that, I am also quite focused on the here and now. And I've been emphasizing with the Incarceration Nation Network's campaign, one of the things we've been doing in this moment has been projecting the words of people who are incarcerated in cities around the world. We projected it in Mexico City last night. We've done it on the Department of Justice in Washington, DC. Um, and, and we call this the Writing on the Wall Project at this moment in the pandemic, when those who are in prisons all over the world are the, are the most vulnerable to this virus. Um, and so we've been doing that to call attention to uh, the crisis, to, to support the organizations in various parts of the world. And this certainly includes Jamaica, uh, where the crisis is dire inside the prisons. I, I myself have been to them and, and engaged with work and collaborative work around trying to reform the system there. Um, this is a moment where we must pay attention to this population. And the hashtag that we are using is defund the prisons. And I'm the first to admit that I am not absolutely mad about that hashtag because it is, it's a negative instead of a positive. Uh, and the real hashtag is not defund the prisons, it's invest in communities. The same way the real hashtag is not defund the police, but invest in communities. Uh, but the reality is that that's the hashtag that's stuck. I do agree with defunding the police, of course, and defunding the prisons. But what it means is we take the funds and we put it in other, uh, in other means and methods. And this is an immediate and very urgent moment to make those demands. The quote that I that has been rattling, rattling around in my head for some time in this moment, uh, first in the pandemic, and now in the context of the revolutionary protests all over the world, is a James Baldwin line where he says, the challenge is in the moment, the time is always now. I think I wake up every day in this moment and say the time is always now. And so while I'm, engaging in the kind of uh, big picture radical imagination that I just, just described, we as an organization, INN, are also calling for some very immediate steps. We are also asking our global partners to come up with their own versions of what defund the prisons looks like. And that means immediate demands that could sort of stop the bleeding in the here and now, and then long-term visionary abolitionist ideals that we are working toward. And I, and I believe we have to do these simultaneously. We need to stop the bleeding. There are band-aids that are necessary, 
but we also need to be thinking systemically and big picture and in the most radical way possible. And I always say that radical is from the word root, uh, the Latin word root, which is uh, means that it is not something that's out there but rather something that's possible in the here and now. And so I will very briefly, so as not to overrun my time, run through in the uh, what we call 13 for the now, uh, the 13 demands that we're making in a US context for uh, addressing this crisis of mass incarceration right here in the moment. And then the six for the win, which we're seeing as the long-term visionary ideal, some of which I already mentioned. Um, so. Very quickly, first, we're demanding uh, that, and, and I should say that, again, whoever's watching this globally and wants to be in touch with INN and, and with me around developing this in, in their particular context, I absolutely welcome that. A lot of this crosses borders, some of it doesn't. Um, the first is the immediate, is free people now. Uh, it's been shown that the US prison population can be reduced by 25% tomorrow. Uh, and we would still have safe communities. And this is, there's loads of data on this and more details can be found on incarcerationnationsnetwork.com. Click on our defund the prisons hashtag and you can get all of the data around that. Um, that of course is a reality that's happening all over the world. People are being released. The US has been lagging behind, the UK has been lagging behind and that needs to change. Uh, so we need to immediately release 25% of the US prison population. We need to decriminalize petty offenses. This is certainly globally applicable. And that includes things like uh, cannabis, but also quality of life offenses that criminalize poverty um, in, in the global south, these old colonial laws uh, around noise reduction and so on that are also a form of criminalizing poverty uh, and that do not funnel people direct, and that thus we do not funnel people directly into the criminal justice system for, in the US, it's misdemeanors, which account for 80% of court dockets. Uh, eliminate pretrial detention. Pretrial detention can be eliminated safely. One of our partners, the Bail Project, has outlined what this looks like. Um, I, I must say that in this moment in Jamaica, with the case of the individual who waited 50 years for trial, this could not be more relevant and is needed. Uh, Pretrial detention is a global crisis, and we need to determine strategies for how to end it safely. We need to stop com turning communities into prisons. Uh, what has been called e-incarceration or electronic incarceration is transforming physical prison bars into virtual ones uh, through electronic monitoring that are making uh, enormous amounts of money for the corporations who own them. We need education, not incarceration. And that means allocating state uh, budgets toward education behind bars, again, globally applicable, and ending the school to prison pipeline that is placing police in schools and funneling people directly in into the criminal justice system, which I'm sure other speakers will touch on. We need to ban the box and eliminate background checks, the box being the, the box on the application that individuals must check to say, I have a criminal record, and they are thus discriminated against uh, as studies show to an overwhelming degree and thus cannot reintegrate uh, and are pushed back into whatever lifestyle may have landed them in prison in the first place. We need to address the issue of parole boards, which are uh, essentially non-transparent entities that are making life or death decisions uh, for people who are inside. We need to phase them out, but in the meantime, we need to make them transparent. Uh, and and visible to the public, we need to know who's on them, how they operate, and 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 change their operations such that they're operating with transparency. We need to think about parole violations. People come out of prison in the U.S. loaded down with curfews and rules and regulations that are designed to be failed. Uh, they are designed to funnel people right back into the system. You cannot expect a grown person to have a curfew of 8 p.m. Uh, and so we know that so many reincarcerations that happen in the U.S. 
are as a result of minor parole violations. In fact, the first person to die of COVID on Rikers Island was in for a minor parole violation. We need to fund reentry, and this relates back to um, not only do we need to not discriminate against people and not allow employers to discriminate against people coming back into society, but we need to actively uh, fund reentry job databases and tax cut incentives for uh, for governments for that that incentivize uh, states to hire people coming home, incentivize employers to hire people coming home, and allow for jobs for people coming home. A vital, vital, vital thing. Uh, we need to, and I'm coming to the end immediately reenfranchise currently and formerly incarcerated people in every state. I'm not sure there's a country I've been to where people have not been shocked to learn that in fact the US in the US in many states you cannot vote if you have been to prison and only one state allows voting while in prison. That needs to end um, and that will impact an estimated 4.5 million voters. We need to divorce capitalism and justice in a big way. And again, this is globally applicable and there are so many ways to do that. Again, we go into detail on our brief on the Incarceration Nations Network website. Um, making state and city prison phone calls free is just one of them. But thinking about the fees and fines associated with uh, our court systems in the US uh, and all of the big companies who are invested in things like electronic monitoring, as I mentioned earlier. We need to end prosecutorial immunity. Uh, if you lock someone up as a prosecutor who is innocent, uh, currently there is no real recourse. There needs to be in the same way there is recourse for um, police who murder people. We need to recognize that prosecutors are not immune. And then lastly, and I think this is a very big one uh, that's again needed all over the world. I've been to few places uh, and Norway is an exception there. I've been to few places where in order to become a corrections officer, like in order to become a police officer, you needed minimal training at most. And it was, a consider it was considered or is considered a bottom of the barrel job. We need to change that by building a true corrections guide training school that looks more like Norway's and pay better and create a scenario where for the time being, while we still need prisons, the people engaged in the work of corrections are true corrections change agents. I won't, in the interest of time, get into our uh, six for the win, but essentially what it is is justice reinvestment. It means reinvesting our budgets in things like reentry services, again, to stop the bleeding in the here and now, in restorative justice programs, in education, incredible messenger uh, and violence interruption and mediation programs, in housing and jobs. I, I, it's not really rocket science to say that investing in these things is what ultimately builds safer communities and takes us toward the future, the, the radically reimagined future that we all want to exist in. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Professor Anthony Harriet is a professor of political sociology and director of the Institute of Criminal Justice and Security at the University of the West Indies. He's the author or co-author of several books, articles, and technical reports, primarily on the issues of violence, organized crime, and policing in Caribbean societies. The books include Police and Crime Control in Jamaica, Problems of Reforming Ex-Colonial Constabularies, 2000, Organized Crime and Politics in Jamaica, Breaking the Nexus in 2008, and Gangs in the Caribbean, The Response of State and Society, with Charles Katz, published in 2014. Professor Harriet was a lead author of the first regional human development report on the Caribbean. This seven country study on citizen security in the region, including St. Lucia, involved a team of some 10 researchers from six universities. He serves on many, many boards and committees, an acclaimed academic. He is also a member of the recently concluded Commission of Inquiry into the Christopher Dudus Koch extradition matter. Professor Anthony Harriot is going to speak to us today on a matter of the abolition, toward a pathway to abolition. The title of my brief advocacy presentation is Finding a Pathway to Abolition. 
the Black Lives Movement protests have put new wind in the sails of the movement for the abolition of prisons and police. Abolitionism has had a long struggle and has had to face the criticism that it is unrealistic, that it really is a dream of idealists. The issue, therefore, is how to chart a realistic pathway to abolition, to prison abolition specifically. My view is that deinstitutionalization is a useful and realistic way of thinking about a route to prison abolition. Total institutions, including the prison, should not have a place in the late 21st century. In this brief presentation, I will identify the expressions of deinstitutionalization in Jamaica and highlight the importance of scaling them up for greater impact on the ways of thinking about alternatives to prison. There are four aspects to deinstitutionalization in Jamaica. First, decriminalization. We have pretty much completed the process of decriminalizing the use of ganja and uh, the Police Citizen Oversight Authority, of which I am a part, a uh, few months after decriminalization did one of its periodic examinations, inspection of Jamaican jails. And the overcrowding problem was literally solved overnight. Um, very few, as I recall, just one jail uh, had remained overcrowded. Thousands of people were no longer being arrested for the use of ganja. <laughs> so that's the first aspect. Second, the increased use of fines. I believe we do not use this enough, and it has great potential to reduce the prison population and be a useful um, way of deinstitutionalizing. Uh, the third is, of course, community service. The problem we have with fines is that when people do not pay their fines, they end up in prison, usually for civil offenses, petty offenses. So there has to be a way around that. And I believe a very simple way is to convert unpaid fines to community service. Community service has merit in its own right and again is underused. There's tremendous potential here for diverting people from prisons. And of course, uh, finally, there is restorative justice. Much work is being done on this and I believe restorative justice holds even greater potential um, not just for deinstitutionalizing and diverting people from the prisons, but solving, helping to solve the difficult problem of violence and various forms of predatory criminality in Jamaica. Now, much of this turns on the idea that punishments are substitutable, that they are equivalent punishments. Um, so, for example, we accept, even on a retributive perspective, that prison time is convertible to fines. Judges make these kinds of sentencing uh, literally every day. People are told six months in jail or X sum of money. So. The idea of the convertibility of punishments is accepted as a part of our system. We just need to use it in more thoroughgoing ways. So uh, let me elaborate uh, a little. Um, if prison time can be converted to fines, then surely it can be converted to other forms of punishment. Um, so, the idea then is that proportionality in punishments is an expression of 
justice in punishments. It's an intuitively accepted idea. Uh, but of course, it runs up on the problem of, for example, rape. Uh, so if one holds to the view, the retributive view, that just punishment should be grounded in the principle of an eye for an eye, and you take that idea literally, what do you do in the case of sex crimes? What do you do in the case of rape? Clearly, it can't be taken um, literally. So if we accept the substitutability of punishments, then we are, it seems to me, morally obliged to take the next step of choosing the most humane substitution. So applied to the prison itself, we may raise the idea, the general idea now, is there a more humane and just alternative, not just to particular forms of imprisonment or particular sentences, but to the prison itself. And I think the principle can be, can be applied. Um, so in that way, we may imagine just punishments taking new forms that are able to replace the idea of the prison. And my argument simply is that deinstitutionalization is a good intermediate um, way of proceeding and that we need to scale it up and scale down the use of prisons. I believe the outcome in the short to medium term would be a tremendous cut in the prison population. I believe it's not unrealistic that we could cut the prison population by half in the medium term. Uh, to conclude, abolitionism is a chapter in the effort to make punishments more humane. It's a long history of trying to make punishments more humane. And there's a line of continuity from the struggle for prisons, which was to get prisons to replace more inhumane forms of punishment, to the present day struggle for the abolition of the prison itself. I think it's useful to see the continuity and for advocacy to draw strength and confidence from the history of these struggles to make punishments more humane and more just. Thank you. Christopher Charles is Professor of Political and Social Psychology in the Department of Government at the University of the West Indies, Mona and is a cultural therapist and senior fellow with Carrie Mensah. Dr. Charles is also a research associate in the psychology department at the Graduate Center of City University of New York and operates a behavioral sleep medicine practice and psychology consultancy in Kingston. He did, did doctoral training in psychology and political science and holds a PhD in psychology from the City University of New York. His main research interests are sports psychology, criminological psychology, political psychology, sleep disorders, black identity, body modification, popular culture, and sexuality. Before going to UWI, he taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the City University of New York and the King Graduate School at Monroe College in New York. He's going to speak to us today on what are some of the solutions to dismantle the institutional support for police brutality and mass incarceration. Today I'll be talking to you about what has been happening in the United States and the support it has received nationally, the Black, the Black Lives Matter movement that is, and the support it has received from around the world. I'll start my presentation today by saying that all the progress that has been made by African Americans in the United States through struggle has been met by white backlash. Every time African Americans as a group 
they have made some progress, there is always a white backlash. The historical evidence is clear. And you can trace this phenomenon from, emancip from the emancipation of the enslaved Africans in America. You can, you can go right through the efforts at desegregation um, typified by the landmark case, Brown versus the Board of Education, through the Civil Rights Struggle, right through the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, right up to the symbolic ele election of Barack Obama as President of the United States. So, I'm saying this because, from my observation, the election of Barack Obama, African-Americans have paid the price. It is as if the police in the United States, when they are engaging an African-American, male or female, it's as if they are engaging the president. And the average African-American, or each African-American becomes a, a proxy, right, for Barack Obama. So that's my take. And you have to understand this within the prison industrial complex in general and the killing of unarmed African Americans in particular. All of this is anchored, embedded in institutional racism. And exactly what is institutional racism? When you look at it, the institutions of the United States or the institutions of American society consistently operate to provide whites with advantages and provide African Americans and other non-whites with disadvantages. Therefore, understanding what is happening now in terms of the Black Lives Matter resistance requires a nested inquiry of how American institutions perpetuate racial inequality and racial injustice. The opportunity for radical systemic change should be seized, given the multiracial and national scope of the Black Lives Matter resistance movement, the protests triggered by the killing of George Floyd, and the global protests in support of the Black Lives Matter resistance movement, as well as the tearing down of statues and other symbols of hate and oppression globally, and the debates that have resulted among oppressed peoples all around the world, and the realization that, in some respects, civil rights in the United States and decolonization and political independence in post-colonial societies are myths. So when I'm saying this, what I actually mean is that you have, we have seen progress in the United States for African Americans, and we have seen progress for Africans outside of the United States. However, this progress um, is not sufficiently far-reaching. We have made gains, but there's still a long way to go. And so when we talk about independence and we talk about rights and citizenship and belonging, in some respects, these are myths for African Americans in the United States and blacks elsewhere in the world. In moving forward, we have to see the murder of George Floyd as a trigger of this global protest and not the cause. So I don't take the position that we are protesting and we are rising up because of George Floyd. We are rising up and we are protesting because many before George Floyd and, and many since have been killed and we have been consistently oppressed for centuries by Europeans all around the world. And this is the centuries of oppression why we are protesting. The unfortunate murder of George Floyd 
by the police was a trigger. But this is centuries of Euro-American oppression. While non-white societies outside of the United States, actually the, the post-colonial societies outside of the United States, are also demanding change, I would like to focus or center my discussion on the situation in the United States, where I spent a large part of my adult life and the country in which I started my academic career at the City University of New York. As Africans living outside of the United States, we know and experience systematic racism right, in our own countries in the global south. And when we travel to or live in the countries of the global north, let us now look at some examples of specific acts of oppression in the United States. For example, African-American children in school are three to four times more likely to be expelled from school than white students. Right? So children are children. They'll give trouble. You just have to provide care and protection and guide them. But African-American children in schools are significantly more likely to be expelled from school compared to white children. We also know that schools in the suburbs of the United States, largely attended by whites, tend to get significantly more funding than schools in the inner city, largely attended by non-whites. We also know that drug use among whites more than double that of African Americans in some places. However, in these places, three times more African Americans are arrested for drug offenses than whites. These are just a few of the systemic injustices perpetrated against African Americans by whites in the United States. These injustices permit permeate banking and finance, education, the criminal justice system, housing, employment, sports, and entertainment, and so on, right? S systemic oppression really is pervasive. So the police murdering African Americans throughout the Union is part of a larger problem of racial injustice in America. And I expect substantive changes to come from the global protests supporting the Black Lives Matter resistance movement. And why am I saying this? Because you can have legislative changes, you can have changes, and we go right back to where we are coming from, in the sense that if we're not vigilant, if we're not careful, The things that cause us to be protesting will continue unabated. So, so even with changes, we know we still have to resist. But what I want is substantial changes coming out of this protest. African Americans, with the support of Africans around the world, and all progressive people should not only vote Right, so African Americans have the support of Africans outside of the United States and the support of progressive people around the world. These African Americans should not only vote, but continue the struggle to get meaningful changes at the federal, at the state and city levels to curb racial inequality and racial injustices. The lobby, the Black Lives Matter resistance movement lobby, should work for the long haul, for the long term, to get important legislative changes. So what am I arguing here? Racial profiling, profiling should be made a hate crime. And we know racial profiling occurs 
in the United States. It is, it is rampant. So you have African Americans, say, 15% of the population. And they comprise 40-50% of all the persons racially profiled. And this is done throughout the Union. So racial profiling should be outlawed. And not just with the police. Those of us who have lived in the United States and still go there because it is our adopted country and we still have our families there and so on, when we go to shop, workers on the floor in the department stores, they follow us around. That is also racial profiling. And this needs to stop. Calling the police on African Americans simply because they are black. Right? A white person calling the cops on an African American simply because they are black and they don't think they should be where they are. This should also be outlawed. I'm also calling for the, the Ku Klux Klan to be banned and be designated a terrorist organization. And I'm heartened that in the discussions coming out of the Black Lives Matter resistance movement, my brothers and sisters in the United States have also been talking about making, pushing to make the KKK a terrorist organization. Also, in terms of substantive changes that I'd like to see coming out of this movement and this protest, police chokeholds should be banned. Qualified immunity for police officers should be removed so that pol police officers can be sued in court for unjust action against citizens. Also, more minorities should be actively recruited to join the police departments throughout the country. Importantly also, redlining should be outlawed. So when African Americans go to purchase a house, the real estate agents shunt them into certain areas because they don't want them in, in, in certain areas, so they only show them um, certain communities. And the staff at the banks, the employees that work on mortgages, they only give mortgage to African Americans for certain communities. Right, so this should be outlawed because what it what it does, it undermines um, the quest for integration. And I know the issue of integration is problematic because some African Americans, for example, the Nation of Islam, argue for a separation. So my argument is whether it's separation or integration, African Americans as a group will have to decide what they want. All I'm arguing for is that redlining should be outlawed. There should also be sanctions for judges throughout the Union that give African Americans very long sentences for crimes that they give whites very little time for. It's the same crime, same set of mitigating circumstances, and African Americans get a very long sentence, and whites a short sentence. This has to stop. And the Black Lives Matter resistance movement should push to get um, this change as well. The unnecessary and unfair expulsion of African American children from school or their arrest by the police for minor infractions, just breaching school rules or acting out, right? Sometimes they're arrested. This must be outlawed as well. Right? Also important here is the issue of medical racism, where mechanisms should be put in place to supervise medical doctors to prevent medical racism via conscious and unconscious biases in hospitals or in doctors' offices. Because African Americans 
are more likely to die when they are treated by white doctors compared to when they are treated by African American doctors. I can recall when I took my mother to see the doctor in New York City and I had to go with her because I didn't trust the system. So we went to the hospital and then doctor realized she has a son who is a, a, a doctoral candidate, a son who is doing a PhD. It changed the dynamics. So understanding America is very important. But we move in and out of the United States, but African Americans by and large tend to remain. And so as citizens, they ought to be protected from medical racism. And they should be outlawed and this and structure should be put in place to ensure that doctors follow equivalent protocols for both whites and non-whites, African Americans in particular. These are just a few of the substantive changes that should come about from the continent resistance from the Black Lives Matter resistance movement. Other substantive changes should follow. These changes should be backed by effective legislations. We should not rest, but as people of Africa, in the diaspora, and with the support of our brothers and sisters on the continent, we should set up monitoring and evaluation committees in each state and in each city, monitoring the various institutions that have to implement the changes backed by legislation to ensure that the changes or the gains of the Black Lives Matter resistance movement are real and substantive. Civil rights organizations and black professional organizations in the various professions, from the various professions, should lead the charge in setting up the monitoring and evaluation committees. For example, the National Association for the, the, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People the Equal Justice Initiative, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the National Action Network, and the Alliance for Justice, as well as the American Civil Liberties Union, among others, have to step up. They have to be more vigilant along with the black, black professional groups to ensure that the changes are real and substantial. The progress from these changes should be evaluated every four years with ongoing organized resistance to ensure that the oppressed is being served by and are benefiting from the changes plucked from the oppressor because of continued struggle. Finally, Africans at home on the continent and those of us in the diaspora have to remember Marcus Garvey and the importance of economic empowerment and economic liberation. This is a very important part of our struggle against European domination and oppression. We have a lot to learn about economic liberation from the nation of Islam. We should save and invest our money in black owned business to build the black community. And we have to be real. As Africans in the diaspora, we won't have everything, so we have to spend our money sometimes elsewhere. But where our black brothers and sisters are entrepreneurs and they have the goods and services at the quality that is comparable to others, we should spend our money in our communities to build the black community. This is an important part of the struggle. So what am I arguing here? What is the take home message? The unfortunate killing 
of George Floyd is not the cause of his struggle. It is the trigger of the struggle. The cause of the struggle is the centuries of African oppression by Europeans. And we demand real and substantive changes from the system and we're, we're demanding it and we are going to get it and we are going to fight and when we get these changes we must set up monitoring and evaluation committees to ensure that the changes are being effected we cannot isolate police brutality and police murder of African Americans from the institutional racism, hence my presentation today. I will close with these words, very important words. Brothers and sisters, one love, one heart, one destiny. The struggle continues. Give thanks. Dr. Kojo Koram is a writer and an academic teaching at the School of Law at Birkbeck College, University of London. Born in Accra, Ghana, and raised in Merseyside, he is now based in London. He was called to the Bar of England and Wales in November 2011 and received his PhD in September 2017. In 2018, the Association for the Study of Law, Culture, and the Humanities awarded his PhD the prestigious Julian Meze Award. In addition to his academic writing, he has written for the New Statesman, The Guardian, Descent, The Nation, and The Washington Post, and has appeared on CNN and Sky News. He is the author or editor of a number of publications, and editor in particular of the book, The War on Drugs and the Global Color Line, published by Pluto Press in 2019. Thank you all for um, joining me here today, and it's great to be talking uh, with such an international and global um, network at a time like this where we are seeing um, perhaps unprecedented um, anti-racist popular mobilization in a lot of different countries around the world. Um, people are really thinking about, you know, the key questions of how race connects with institutional violence like policing and prisons and immigration and the other structures that facilitate racial discrimination and racial oppression all across the world. And um, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is one particular area of the law, one particular legal tradition, one particular institution that reinforces both the ideological element of racial violence and the material element of racial violence. And what I'm talking about here is the um, the, the kind of a hundred year um, phenomena that we most commonly refer to as the war on drugs. Um, the process of the criminalization of particular um, drugs at international law level, and then narrowed down to the domestic law level, tied in with a system of imprisonment, policing and overcriminalization of disproportionately black and global south populations um, so th this is something that really has been a has been a focus of my research um, you know from when I began my PhD um, including a lot of the activism work that I've done as well and I think that it's something that we haven't talked about enough within the black community there's still um, the kind of stigma and taboo around questions around drugs and the the kind of um, the deviancy and the and and the dangers around drugs, but I think what's that stopping us from doing is appreciating how much the war on drugs and the criminalization of drugs in the way that they've been in, um, affected over the last half a century have resulted in increasing rates of black people in prisons in countries not just the United States but also the United Kingdom, also Brazil, also Colombia. You know, it's not allowing us to think about how the kind of international chains of prohibition have resulted in the reinforcement of um, militarized policing um, from countries in the global north, primarily the United States, onto countries, you know, in the Caribbean like Jamaica, in Latin America like Colombia or Brazil. And um, this is something that I think we really need to take our times to try and think through and also, more crucially, as we're in an area in which it seems like at least around one of the drugs, cannabis, the war on drugs is ending, thinking about how we can use that moment of ending in order to rebalance some of the racial and economic injustice that has been suffered by black communities all around the world for the last 50 or so years.
So just a little bit of um, details around the war on drugs for those who might not be familiar. Um, so when we're talking about the war on drugs, we are talking about um, what is essentially a relatively recent international phenomenon. You know, um, drugs have been used. Um, the main kind of drugs we think about, cannabis, cocaine, opium, have been used by a plethora of communities all around the world in lots of different forms, whether that be religious, whether that be ritualistic, you know, anthropologists, people might want to look at the work of Ross Coomber and Nigel South have, you know, looked through all different types of communities around the world and have struggled to find any that don't have some sort of intoxication use um, within some form. But over the past hundred years, at international law level, primarily driven by the United States and its kind of seizure of a, of, of a status as the world's policeman, um, there has been a set of laws passed starting with the 1909 Shanghai Opium Commission and then really being reinforced following the United Nations era with the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, 1961, which criminalized um, a lot of these substances that were being grown and produced in areas in the global south and that were being consumed primarily within countries in the global north. And so already you have that imbalance in the kind of geographic setup of the international drugs trade. But often we're talking about substances grown and produced in countries like Brazil, Colombia, Afghanistan, Jamaica, Kenya, being consumed primarily within Northern European and the United States of America, Northern American markets. And so the attempt to enforce the ultimate prohibition of these substances, the complete erasure of them. And this isn't something that's just um, rhetorical. Um, this is this is the, the stated goal of the international laws that were passed. Um, people might want to have a look at the United Nations 1998 um, special session on drugs, which was entitled A Drugs-Free World, We Can Do That. Um, so people can decide for themselves whether that's been achieved, whether drugs have been erased or not. But um, that has been the stated goal. And in order to facilitate the, the realization of that goal, we have seen um, huge increases in police budgets, huge increases in the um, weaponry the police are about, allowed to use, huge increases in the tactics of um, surveillance and containment of particularly black and um, Afro-Caribbean communities in places like the United States and the United Kingdom and France. Um, we've seen, um, quasi-military operations like Plan Colombia, um, started by the United States uh, in alliance with the Colombian government in, 19, in the 1990s, that facilitated, you know, aerial fumigation of whole areas of rural land within um, areas of Colombia, primarily occupied by Afro-Colombian and indigenous Colombian people. Um, we've seen devastating impacts upon communities of color all around the world, and yet we've seen rates of drug use increase, rates of drug addiction increase, the amount of people who are dying from drug deaths increase. And this is all by the United Nations own um, statistics. And so what we have is a phenomenon in which we have a policy that damages the lives disproportionately of black and brown people all across the world and that doesn't achieve its own stated goals in trying to reduce the drugs trade and drug supply all around the world. And so we start to see the real relationship between the war on drugs and phenomena such as mass incarceration and neocolonialism. Um, for mass incarceration, I'd really recommend anybody who hasn't had the chance to read to look at Miss Alexander's The New Jim Crow, a book which really details um, just how indebted to um, the histories of racial violence and racial oppression the war on drugs has become. Um, so we're thinking about, in, in this book, Michelle Alexander traces how the war on drugs is the latest instantiation of a system of racial division and racial oppression that goes back in the United States from Jim Crow segregation to plantation slavery, um, you know, tracing it all the way up to today's system of mass incarceration. Um, we also are seeing, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, the way in which some of the sovereignty and self-determination of the countries of the global south has been eroded and eradicated by the programs of counter-narcotics, of global counter-narcotics. And we're starting to see, you know, the, the, the impacts on places like Mexico and places like Colombia um, exceeding 
some of the statistics in terms of death and in terms of um, suffering that we have seen in countries that are officially in conditions of kind of recognized international war between 2006 and 2012, there was actually a higher death rate within Mexico than there was within Afghanistan at around that time. And so we need to really start to think about, can we improve the lives of black people around the world? Can we really talk about black lives mattering without challenging one of the major frameworks that have erased and eradicated and um, impinged upon the quality of black life within the last 50 to 60 years, which is the war on drugs. And I'm not just talking about the, um, the black lives that have been lost to the violence of the war on drugs and to people who have passed away. We're not just talking about the black lives who've been lost to systems of imprisonment and over-policing. We're thinking about what's the knock-on consequences of that. So convictions around, um, you know, around having uh, non-violent drug convictions in places like the United States, in places like the United Kingdom, can stop people being able to get public housing once they leave, can stop black people being able to get um, access to particular jobs once they leave, can ensure that there is a permanent mark and often uh, a tie into the criminal justice system that can take a lifetime to escape from, if at all possible. And, um, you know, this has been a real, real driver of mass incarceration in the United States up to half of all federal prisoners in the USA are actually um, in prison for nonviolent drug offenses at the moment. So we're really seeing a, a, a phenomenal, um, a phenomenal, uh, what's it called, comparison to other s histories of kind of racial discrimination. However, this is something that has started to be challenged, challenged by countries around the world who started to see the futility of the war on drugs, as well as the racially discriminatory impact of the war on drugs, challenged by activists. Um, one I would really recommend is a fantastic sister in the United States who now runs the Drug Policy Alliance, which is the largest drug um, policy reform organization in the world, um, Cassandra Frederick. Um, so her work, everyone should really be engaging with, um, you know, when we're thinking about how, you know, if we want to talk about questions of prison reform or prison abolition, if we want to talk about police reform or police abolition, we need to be talking about the war on drugs. She really makes those connections um, very clear. And the work of a lot of these um, activists and organizations has led to a position in 2020 where we're starting to see the war on drugs fragment a bit. So after, since 1961, and particularly um, kind of, um, growing exponentially in the 1980s and 1990s, the phenomenon of the war on drugs is starting to fade. And we're starting to see countries such as Canada, such as Uruguay, deviate from the international conventions, although they're trying to say they're not, but in terms of legalizing a recreational cannabis market, and cannabis remains one of the, the, the controlled substances on the 61 convention provision list, we have to think that they're deviating. And um, we're starting to see countries like Portugal, of introduce complete decriminalization of all drugs. And I can talk a little bit um, about the difference between legalization and decriminalization. It's quite a technical difference for those who might be interested in terms of the questions. But we're starting to see countries and a lot of states within the United States of America, California, Colorado, Alaska, Massachusetts, all these states implementing legal cannabis markets um, and deviating from that system of automatic prohibition, policing and imprisonment that has, that has been connected to, to the war on drugs over the last 50 to 60 years. Um, but this isn't necessarily automatically a positive. I think that we cannot bring an end to the war on drugs without trying to repair the harm that has been done through the war on drugs. And this is where questions of racial justice become very, very important. When we're talking about ending the war on drugs, as some activists have been doing in the US, we have to be talking about repairing the harm that has been done to the communities that have been over-policed, that have been over-imprisoned. We have to ensure that those people whose lives have been damaged by the war on drugs have a pathway to be able to enter into the now highly profitable and highly lucrative legal markets that are being established. Um, a lot of the cannabis companies that are being set up in the United States of America are really benefiting from huge amounts of private investment, especially because people struggle to get federal loans because it's still federally illegal. And so often a lot of the, the companies that are entering in there are 
very rich data companies, oil companies, tech companies, um, and, you know, in terms of the actual racial makeup of those companies, not reflective of the people who've suffered disproportionately the harms of the war on drugs. These aren't companies that are filled with black and brown faces that are looking to establish the now legal regulated cannabis market. In fact, in some of the early states like Colorado, which passed the um, which passed the, the, the legalization of cannabis and didn't include any questions around racial justice and social justice, what you had was a system in which anyone who did have drug convictions which again, disproportionately black and brown people, were legally barred from getting a job or entering into the legal cannabis market. They couldn't get a license for a dispensary. They couldn't work for a dispensary. Um, so you actually get a reinforcement of those racial inequalities. You end the war on drugs, but you have a free for all for Wall Street hedge funders and data companies and a reinforcement of the economic um, deprivation of black and brown communities. Fortunately, this lesson has been learned in a lot of places that have come subsequently. And so Massachusetts might be the best example so far where there has been a lot of work to include within the legislation licenses that are available for communities that were over-policed and over-incarcerated, um, training that is being facilitated for those communities to ensure that they're able to navigate the bureaucracy of the legal cannabis market and able to enter into the new industry and reap some of the benefits and allow for that re rebalancing of that economic injustice. Um, and I think this needs to happen as well at an international scale. I think that, you know, now we're having these conversations, we don't want to have a situation as we see in places like Canada, where there's now a legalization of cannabis, but there is also a requirement for that cannabis to be grown within Canada. And so you've seen big airport hangars in rural Canada now growing, now growing cannabis and the, um, the agricultural farmers in places like Jamaica or in Mexico who were growing these substances are now being cut out of the new legal market. You know, when we're thinking about the ending of the war on drugs and the establishment of a new, um, essentially a new commodities market, I think we really want to take this opportunity, bring in together a lot of the energy and activism and determination that's been brought to bear in the streets over the last few weeks around racial justice and around Black Lives Mattering and bring it to the question of how are we going to frame this new commodities market? How are we going to ensure that this isn't going to reinforce the economic and racial inequality that we've seen, um, you know, since the end of colonialism? Because, you know, we all know that things don't have to be illegal for them to have racial and geographic, um, uh, um, you know, unjust patterns, you know, look at the history of gold or oil, and we can see those those patterns um, emerging. We don't want cannabis to reinforce that. We want to take this opportunity to say, the last century of war on drugs has disproportionately damaged individuals from black and brown communities. If we're going to bring that to an end, we're going to create a new commodities market. We're only going to do that with the question of racial justice at the center of the way cannabis might be legalized and distributed. Vereen Shepard, professor of history, is the host of Talking History on Nationwide 90 FM. She's a social historian, a vice chair of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and also director of the Center for Reparation Research and the immediate past university director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies. She spent five years as a member of the UN's working group of experts on people of African descent, um, as well as chair. As a published author, she has written several books. Among them, I Want to Disturb My Neighbor, Lectures on Slavery, Emancipation, and Postcolonial Jamaica. She has numerous publications and, and, and based on those publications has been a recipient of the UWI Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Public Service and as well based on her research. She was one of 70 plus seven women awarded for service to the UWI during the institution's 70th anniversary celebrations and is one of 60 women included in the Gleaners Jamaica Women of Distinction. We are pleased to have Vereen with us for this forum. Over to you, Vereen. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the opportunity to participate in this forum with my presentation on resistance memory monuments. 
I congratulate the organizers for the intellectual insight that went into its planning and greet all my fellow presenters. At the end of my presentation, I hope that three fundamental questions would have been addressed. One, how has the recent global anti-racism conversation with part of its focus on reshaping visual memory resonated in the Caribbean? Two, should the region review, refine, and reassess its history of iconographic decolonization? Three, Sabine Marshall states the following. A memorial constitutes a transitional object that facilitates the process of mourning. Public commemoration, especially through lasting memorials of selected dead heroes, can be a strategic move to legitimate the emergence of a new socio-political order. Are we on the road to a new socio-political order as we revisit the sites of memory to our fallen comrades and contemplate removing those of others? From an empirical point of view, I will demonstrate the importance of acting intentionally on memory by reminding us of our history of resistance that has served us well in the ongoing process of replacing the stamp of the colonizer and placing the stamp of the colonized on the post-colonial landscape. Now, since the 1960s and the height of the Black Power movement in the Caribbean, there has been the articulation of a desire for the erection of symbolic monuments to freedom fighters against conquest and colonization, enslavement, and post-emancipation worker subjugation through indentureship and other manifestations of unfreedom. This presentation looks in particular at the ways in which people in the Caribbean have honored the memory of their enslaved ancestors forcefully re relocated to the Americas during the first period of globalization. More specifically, I summarize the ways in which we in the region have erected statues and other memorials to those who were resistors to the colonial project. We can say they were early political activists using organized collective action, which aimed at creating a consciousness of collective interest to subvert the system, to facilitate and regularize escape from it, or at the very least, to force important changes in it, in Fredrickson and Lash's formulation. For among despised and downtrodden people in general, the most rudimentary form of political action is violence based on a common sense of outrage. With respect to female activists, Lucille Mathurin Mayer has reminded us that the militant acts of women were neither isolated nor inadvertent, rather, they constituted a political strategy that took different forms at different times, but at all times expressed the conscious resolve to confront the new world's assault on their person and their culture. The reaction to this is seen in the many protest actions that downtrodden people and their supporters took to insist on the right to be. There was never a generation of indigenous Caribbean people or of enslaved Africans who did not engage in protests in defense of their human rights. Indeed, one of the most rebellious parts of the Atlantic world was the Caribbean. In this part of the world, inhabitants honed the practice of marinage, used here in René de Pest's broader sense of a historical process resulting from maroon activity outside of the plantation system that engendered new modes of thinking, of acting, of feeling, of imagining. As Rex Dentifer pointed out in Caribbean cultural identity, while the Caribbean shares in the great drama of the Americas, of which it is an integral part, in this part of the world, 
people engage in a process of shaping an indigenous Caribbean lifestyle and a new viable worldview born out of the collective experience of a long dominated but rebellious people, now enslaved, now brutalized, now pressured into cultural submission, now colonized, but never defeated. The Caribbean has been insistent that these long enslaved and brutalized people need to be memorialized in tangible ways outside of what is possible in the written text. Post-colonial political regimes operating within a culture of heroization have duly recognized and built monuments to honor the leaders of these anti-slavery movements. We can think of Chief Techi, Nana of the Maroons, and Sam Sharp in Jamaica. And on your screen, you can go from left to right to see the images of these anti-slavery heroes and heroines. Dessalines and Toussaint in Haiti, Bussa in Barbados, Satouye in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, King Court in Antigua Barbuda, Coffee and Damon in Guyana, Tula in Curacao, Alida in Nikeri on the border of Guyana and Suriname, and Kwako in Suriname. Outside of the Caribbean, there are monuments to anti-slavery heroes and heroines, and the designs of these monuments in the Americas, the result of efforts to inscribe the cultural decolonization project on the historic landscape, represent a change from earlier ones. For as Lawrence Brown has pointed out, and I quote, in the wake of emancipation, representations of freedom across the 19th century focused on the image of the liberator through monuments leading European abolitionists like Shelsha, constructed from the Caribbean to Edinburgh, from Edinburgh to New York, from Strasbourg to London. Such monuments often depicted the enslaved as passive recipients rather than as active initiators of their freedom. We have changed that in the Caribbean to destabilize that narrative. But to my second question, should we review, refine, and reassess our history of iconographic decolonization? My answer, absolutely. Absolutely, because we can erect war memorials to groups of anti-slavery heroes and heroines alongside the statues and monuments to individual heroes and heroines. There are three reasons for this view. One, war memorials are now familiar sites in the landscape of many countries. These provide insight into the changing face of commemoration, as well as to military, social, and political history. Second, there has been a change from the construction of war memorials only for the elite and high-ranking soldiers. So the commemoration of the war dead of all ranks is no longer an unusual occurrence, as was the case in the years before World War I. People in the Caribbean have never failed to do their part to honor the war dead of the 1914 to 1918 and the 1938 to 45 conflicts. Jamaica, for example, has a cenotaph in National Heroes Park, and most Caribbean states hold Remembrance Day services during the month of November, and, we, and some people wear puppies. The third rationale is that armed revolt played a fundamental role in achieving Caribbean freedom. Many wars were staged in the Caribbean from the moment of conquest and colonization, but the indigenous peoples and the enslaved were not incorporated into the Atlantic world as citizens with equal rights, but as chattel enslaved an inferior, quote unquote, other. Therefore, the anti-slavery struggles and later decolonization movements would illustrate the lack of consensus even within discrete economic zones like the British Empire. Indeed, Hilary Beckles has long argued that the many revolts and plots staged by the enslaved between 1638 
and 1838 in the British colonized Caribbean alone could be conceived of as the 200 years war. One protracted struggle launched by Africans and their African West Indian progeny at times with minimal participation from free people against their enslavers. Michael Creighton has provided an overview of the chronology, the frequency, and the intensity of these revolutionary wars in the British Caribbean, showing that over 75 plots and actual armed protests occurred in the British Caribbean alone between the 17th and 19th centuries, 22 in Jamaica. He has tracked the geography of some of these, like the 1760 war led by Chief Techie and Chief Jamaica in Jamaica, the 1816 war in Barbados led by Busa, and the 1823 war in Demerara, now of course Guyana. He has also published contemporary visual images, some representations by the English militia, that suggest that these were no mere skirmishes, but outright wars, organized armed protests. The images of enslaved people, free blacks and white militiamen with rifles and in military gear and formation abound starting from visual representation of maroon wars and continuing through to 19th century liberation struggles. John K. Thornton reminds the scholars that they should not be reluctant to acknowledge that protests of enslaved people in the Caribbean were planned and executed primarily by enslaved people with military skills and experience. Using the example of Haiti, he stresses that the enslaved had remarkable capacities for war and they did not fight desperate wars. The love of liberty and enthusiasm alone could not win wars, could not defeat cold steel. So on the contrary, the enslaved did not suddenly rise from agricultural laborers to military prowess. Many arrived from Africa with military skills, indeed, African military service had been one route through which many had entered the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans as war captives or prisoners of war. Many had served in African armies prior to arrival in the Caribbean. Thornton uses this issue of military prowess among new African arrivals to help to explain the success of the Haitian Revolution. Later armed protests in other territories would demonstrate, however, as Creighton reinforces, that the lack of a military tradition did not prevent New World Creole Blacks from seizing, sometimes spontaneously, the weapons that came to hand. The reports of the 1831-32 Emancipation War in Jamaica, for example, indicate that urban-based Sam Sharp appointed Colonel Gardner to be his military tactician and strategist. The principal enslaved leaders also organized the whole of Western Jamaica into revolutionary teams, some would call themselves. And the leader of each was given a military designation, for example, colonel and captain. That was also indicates in Black Rebellion in Barbados that the leaders of 1816 laid down precise military plans involving the use of small contingents drawn from most plantations to attack the militia. We are only slowly moving to collective memorials like the Monument to the Maroons in Haiti in recognition of their fundamental contribution to the success of the Haitian Revolution. There is a Freedom Monument in Montego Bay, Jamaica, because over 600 enslaved Africans and their free supporters were tried and punished most by hanging in the war led by Sam Shah. Their lives matter. There are also collective tributes on the landscape in Martinique and Guadeloupe, as we can see on the other two slides. But over 400 people were murdered in the post slavery justice protest led by Paul Bogle in Jamaica. Their lives matter, and we await that monument to the Marathi War of 1865 when we deal intentionally with post-slavery memorials. The point then 
It's that the tradition of building monuments to heroic individuals is well established in the Caribbean. But we need to seek out the names of those who supported the leaders and recognize their worth to demonstrate the saying in Jamaica that one hand alone can clap. The rationale for this new type of monument is that in the process of mapping and remapping the post-colonial cultural landscape, singling out leaders and sculpting and mounting them in parks and museums, or constructing artistic impressions and representations of the African experience, the rank and file in the liberation struggles have been forgotten. Perhaps because they were once viewed as criminals and violent protesters who upset the peace and stability of plantation societies. In her book, Pointing to the Dead, Victims, Martyrs and Public Memory in South Africa, Sabine Marshall writes, a memorial constitutes a transitional object and public, publicly advertises a lasting visible link with the dead society chooses to honor. In times of political transition, the public commemoration, especially through lasting memorials of selected dead heroes or fallen comrades can be a strategic move to legitimate the emergence of a new sociopolitical order. I started with that question as my number three question. The recognition of the use value of specific dead bodies is part of a larger process of appropriating the past for the political, social, cultural, or economic purposes of the present, which many scholars now see as a key characteristic of heritage. Finally, how has the recent global anti-racism conversation with part of its focus on reshaping visual memory resonated in the Caribbean? The truth is that it has forced us to pick up back where we left off in the heavy 1960s and 70s, and perhaps even the early part of the 1980s, the era of black power. But an important component of our post-colonial project was the elimination of most of the symbols that helped to perpetuate an imperial mentality. Birthday of monarchs as national holidays, British education and curricula, the reciting of patriotic poems and the singing of patriotic songs like Rule Britannia. Jamaica and other Caribbean countries have reoriented our curricula, renamed streets, highways, parks, and buildings, created national symbols like flags, anthems, and pledges, instituted our own national holidays, for example, Emancipation Day, National Heroes Day, Labor Day as well as institutionalized national heroes by which governments have identified and transformed historical figures into markers of national identity. But we still have not completed that project of iconographic decolonization. We still have statues of Admiral Nelson in Barbados. We have statues of Columbus and Queen Victoria across several Caribbean countries. Parishes, towns, restaurants, buildings, apartment complexes, schools, and awards take the names of colonizers and planters, and churches honor enslavers inside their hallowed spaces. So some are calling for us to complete this project of iconographic decolonization started in the 60s and 70s, a significant component of which is to remove the status of colonizers from our landscape with the most intense Columbus must fall movement in Trinidad and Tobago. Do we detect the same energy to do so as in the USA and parts of Europe? Not everywhere would be my answer. Elitist pro-colonialism, lack of history education among the people, and the fact that we live with the fear of COVID-19 have affected the numbers who would potentially go out on street protests. Maybe the discovery in Jamaica that the governor general wears a racist symbol, reminiscent of the image of a white policeman standing on the neck of George Floyd, will be the spark that we need to complete the unfinished business 
supporting our brothers and sisters in what has now become a global anti-racism movement and removing the physical reminders of our oppression from our landscape. Otherwise, we will be accused of participating in our own oppression. In conclusion, my talk today has been about historical memory and what we in the Caribbean as individuals or as a collective and the Caribbean states more broadly, conscious of our ancestors' historic contributions have done with such memory. Catherine Hodgkin and Savannah Radstone in contested past, the politics of memory, note that contests over the meaning of the past are also contests over the meaning of the present and over ways of taking the past forward. Though the content of the politics of memory is rooted in past events, the desired communicative effect of this discourse is clearly directed and motivated by contemporary politics. Which is why the field of memory studies is not just the preserve of historians. Regardless, we need these tangible sites of memory because they can guide us as we attempt this year to recover the fragmented silence, screaming memories of slavery. Otherwise, the pain expressed in Toni Morrison's 1989 poem will continue to haunt us. No place you or I can go to think about or not to think about. Nothing that reminds us of the ones who made the journey and of those who did not make it. I thank you. Akela is a BAFTA and MOBO award-winning hip-hop artist, writer, and social entrepreneur, as well as a co-founder of the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company. With an extensive global touring history, Akela has appeared at numerous festivals, both in the UK and internationally, and has led innovative projects in the arts, education, and music across Southeast Asia, Africa, India, Australia, and New Zealand. A well-traveled man. Akela has also appeared on Channel 4, ITV, MTV, Sky Arts, and the BBC, promoting his music and poetry and speaking on a wide ranging list of subjects from music, race, youth engagement, British slash African Caribbean culture and the arts with numerous online lectures and performances that have millions of views on YouTube. We are pleased to have Akela with us who most recently was awarded an honorary doctorate by Oxford Brookes University. Akela has gained a reputation as one of the most dynamic and articulate talents in the UK. We are pleased to hear from you, Akela. So what I wanted to address really was the question, what is the future of Pan-African education? From a personal perspective, I was very, very lucky. Uh, growing up in the UK during the late 60s and early 70s, there was massive educational disenfranchisement for uh, British African Caribbeans. And so my parents' generation growing up in that era set up special Pan-African Saturday schools uh, to teach African history, to teach Garveyite philosophy, to teach Rodney, and all of that context of everything that was going on with, with the Black Power movement, everything that was going on uh, with decolonization, so on and so forth. Um, there was a sort of contradictory uh, situation or poison chalice in a way that on the one hand, the British education system had disenfranchised a generation of British born uh, Caribbean migrants. On the other hand, part of the great tradition of resistance to that disenfranchisement was the setup of these special Pan-African Saturday schools. I went to one of those schools. It was called the Winnie Mandela School. It was really just, you know, a few portal cabins in the, in the south of Camden, which is in the borough that I grew up. Um, and we went only on a Saturday. For the rest of the time, we were at regular British state school. But the difference it made to my upbringing, to my worldview, to my idea, Years about what it meant to be black and what black culture was. It's only now I'm an adult I really appreciate, I think, how incalculable um, a difference it made to my life, how much it was an inoculation against a lot of the internalized anti blackness that is constantly bombarded, um, or you're constantly bombarded by within Western media and within British society and, and within the world in more general, how much it was an inoculation against a lot of the anti African conditioning that 
still exists even in Africa itself and in, in the Caribbean in terms of the legacies of the colonial education system and a lot of the myths that are still prevalent about what African civilization looked like in the medieval era and ancient times, a lot of the myths that are still prevalent about what African spirituality is or isn't, and how much to a certain degree, even in Africa and the Caribbean, the great work of Pan-Africanist scholars has or hasn't filtered into the way in which history is taught, the way in which philosophy is taught, even with Africa and the Caribbean. So here in the UK over the last few years, one of the big conversations has been about decolonizing the curriculum, removing uh, a colonial presence from within the British education system, or at least a colonial gaze. And it's fascinating because working, as I've been lucky to do across the continent in the Caribbean, you still, still see a lot of that colonial gaze and a lot of those colonial myths are taught within Africa and the Caribbean, or at least a certain amount of Eurocentrism still seems to pass unquestioned in the high school curriculum, in, in the primary school curriculum. And that's not to say that I think we should divorce entirely um, from some of the legacies of uh, European educational systems. I think in a way, if, if we think about say late 19th century Japan, you think of the Meiji restoration where Japan essentially went or did a tour of the world. Now I'm not saying we should, Africa and the Caribbean should be aiming to imitate what Imperial Japan did politically. But in terms of what happened in the Meiji Restoration, where Japan essentially went around the centers of civilization at the time, went to Germany, went to London, went to New York, and assessed how much of the technological, scientific, political advances of those cultures and civilizations Japan needed to adopt. And yet Japan managed to adopt all of those influences, many of those influences for its own gain and for its own benefit without ceasing to be Japanese, without throwing away what is intrinsically Japanese. And I, I feel like in Africa and the Caribbean, if I may, and even among the diaspora, a sort of similar assessment still needs to happen where we look at what can be learned from India, what can be learned from China, what can be learned from the West, if we think of the major civilizational entities that exist in the world today. But to what extent have we been brainwashed by anti-African conditioning and to what extent to many of our assumptions, I think of my own grandmother, who I love very, very much, rest in, rest in power to my grandmother, who almost till her dying day would have told you, men in Africa, right? What happened in her childhood, in her education, in growing up in, in, in Jamaica in the 1930s, and then her experience of what she thought it meant to be African, uh, living in the UK from the 60s onwards, that would make her separate herself from what is actually very recent ancestry. It's not, it's not like, People of African heritage came to Jamaica a thousand years ago. We're talking maybe five or six generations back, maybe even less than that for, pe for people like my grandmother, who knows? Um, so what had happened to give her that condition and that feeling, that idea that hasn't happened, say, for Italian-Americans? You, you, you wouldn't see an Italian-American Italian say, I'm not Italian, as if being Italian was some kind of insult or a German heritage American and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I think, yes, there needs to be as much absorbed and taken on board from Asia, from the West, from the United States, anything that is useful uh, for the furtherance of, of Pan-African civilization and, and, and uh, for the curriculum and for really civilization building, if we think in those terms. But I do think there needs to be a serious redress, um, almost like try attempted to happen in the 70s with Sheikh Anta Diop, with Malefi Asante, with what happened in the post-Black Power movement, and what happened even before that with Garvey? What happened even bef a century before that with Martin Delaney? There have been many attempts to redress some of the anti-African conditioning, but because we they have not gone hand in hand with sort of owning the means of production and with economic development and so on and so forth, uh, African and Caribbean societies have not, in, in my view, been able to fully reform and redress the ways in which they, they've been brainwashed against, or we've been brainwashed against, our own interests and many of the greatest cultural, historical, political, uh, scientific figures within African uh, history are not well known within the African diaspora. The fact that there was mass literacy in Islamic West Africa is not so well known within the diaspora. The fact that we have uh, some of the oldest evidence of iron smelting in the African continent is not well known within the diaspora. The fact that there is uh, ancient uh, astronomical observatories, places like the Nabta Playa and so on and so forth is not well known within the diaspora. And none of that is to say that we need to navel gaze and say, well, you know, our ancestors were great, so all the work is done. It is more about, like any civilization or any history, 
understanding that, or as the great Dr. John Henry Clark puts it, history is a map that people use to locate themselves in a situation of human geography. Or history is a clock that people use to tell their cultural, spiritual, political, and economic time of day. It tells them where they have gone, where they are now, and where, and where they must go. And so for me, that is the way in which history must be used. We must learn some of the painful lessons of the past, and of course, uh, not romanticize the past, but an accurate knowledge of the facts in my own life um, made an enormous difference to the way I felt about my own African heritage, about the way I understood my place in the world, and about the mission I've tried to take on as an adult. And so I feel or tried to take on as an artist or so on and so forth, and the things that I will teach my children. And I've seen the effect that a lack of that knowledge had on many brothers who grew up very similar to me in a socioeconomic sense, where what people believe to be black identity was a sort of refracted racist caricature of what black identity really is. And a lot of this is bound up with class too. Here in the UK, the, the British class system means that a lot of poor white kids also have a culture in which what they believe their identity to be plays up to many of the class stereotypes of what it means to be poor in British society. So I'm not suggesting that any of these things are in any way unique to black people. Um, I'm just saying that for me, I think that is a mission that, that still awaits and I think it's all well and good and we should continue to decolonize curriculums and challenge uh, Eurocentric hegemony within Western societies, within the university and the academy in the United States and within Britain. But I think a lot of that work still needs to happen in Jamaica. A lot of that work still needs to happen in Nigeria. A lot of that work still needs to happen in Ghana. A lot of that work still needs to happen in Zimbabwe and, and so on and so forth. In, in my experience, and I could be completely wrong with this, and this is what I'll close on, the only country in Africa, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to teach in, in maybe 14 countries on the continent and work and learn in 14 countries on the continent. The only society I went to where it seemed that a genuine overview of pre-colonial African history was common knowledge was Ethiopia. And obviously Ethiopia has its own surviving written language. It has a history where it wasn't a formal colony, so on and so forth. So none of that surprised me. In many other societies, there, there seemed to be a lot of, uh, almost a truncation of historical knowledge um, that in a way began with colonialism. And in, in, in the Caribbean, while there is some great work taught and great knowledge about slave revolts, and Sam Sharp and Nanny of the Maroons and Marcus Garvey and all that sort of stuff, in common knowledge because they are national heroes in a Jamaican context, I'm not sure how much of the civilizational history of African Jamaicans has made its way into common knowledge and into the school system and into the university system. Um, within a Jamaican context. And I, I humbly assert that I think that is important alongside learning Newtonian physics, alongside learning Elizabethan fear, alongside learning uh, the modern quantum physics, alongside anything else we may absorb from anywhere else, having a genuine and accurate sense of your own ancestors' place in the world and, and how they thought about the world and how they conceived the world um, is tremendously important for the direction of the future. So for me, the future of Pan-African education begins with a, a foreign knowledge of, of Pan-African history and not just kings and queens and things of that nature, but philosophy, scientific advances, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. Dr. Christopher Emdin is the creator of the Hip Hop Ed social media movement and Science Genius Battles. He's the author of the award-winning book, Urban Science Education for the Hip Hop Generation and the New York Times bestseller for white folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too. Currently, Professor of Science and Education in the Department of Mathematics, Science and Technology at Teachers College, Columbia University. He serves as Director of the Science Education Program and Associate Director of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education. He's an alumni fellow at the Hutchins Center at Harvard University and served as STEAM Ambassador for the US Department of State and Minorities in Energy Ambassador for the US Department of Energy. He is a social critic, public intellectual, and science advocate whose commentary on issues of race, culture, inequality, STEM, and education have appeared in dozens of in in influential periodicals, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. We are very pleased to have you, Christopher. Please share with us. I'm so honored to be able to share space with all of you who are, and who are watching this conversation today.
the topic of black futures, equal rights, and the call to dismantle systemic racism is so timely, so important, and such a significant piece of the larger narrative across the globe of decentering whiteness and centering uh, black lives, centering Afrocentric approaches to teaching and learning, and most importantly, bringing marginalized voices that traditionally have been pushed outside of the discourse in imagination or the futures of blackness to become prominent. You know, when I think of black futures, this is not a project or an initiative that focuses on the black elite having conversations about what our future looks like, but most importantly, about those who are within this sort of larger monolith of blackness that sit within the interstitial spaces who have not yet had opportunities to be able to have that, their voice being heard, be the ones who are centered in what black futures look like. Um, in many ways, given the privileges afforded to me to be a scholar and, a, as an, and an academic, I serve as a person who benefits from certain privileges, but I utilize those privileges or I work to imagine those privileges in ways that give me a platform to open up spaces to give voice to those who've been historically marginalized. So when I think about black futures, it's not the futures of black intellectuals or as articulated by black intellectuals, but as articulated by those who may be black intellectuals that speak for the larger community or those who have a foot in the hood and a foot in academia. Those who have a foot in understanding the experiences of poverty and being socioeconomically sort of uh, marginalized and also having access to power and discourse. Black futures to me is about all black futures. Um, even as we center black lives in itself and talking about black lives matter in the context of that mattering, also understanding that we're talking about all black lives mattering and not just the voice of the black elite. And for me, this work, this moment of imagining black futures is about censoring ratchet voices. Uh, it's about censoring voices within hip hop that are not viewed as having intellectual sort of prowess. It's about censoring for me in particular in this moment, in this season, uh, the culture of dance hall that's been marginalized within larger Jamaican culture. It's about those who've not had a chance to fit. So black futures is like, how do those who have been ratchet, those who've been pushed to the margins, allowed to imagine what Black futures look like. And to me, Black futures is about a, a welcoming of all forms of Blackness and a, a, a not a policing of Black expression, not a policing of, of um, Black modes of thought that are perceived to be pejorative, but rather a reimagining of this, this, uh, this intellectual gumbo, this, this, this flavor that allows all of us to be centered in, in, in articulating what our futures look like. Um, when I think about equal rights, it is equal rights for black folks, but it's also equal rights for those who've been pushed for the margins. And when I think about the call to dismantle systemic racism is to understand that systemic racism does not persist unless there, unless there are black voices within uh, established structures that allow for systemic racism to persist. So how are black voices who, is, who are established within academia, established within politics, established within media, not allowing themselves to be intellectually and psychologically and spiritually colonized where they don't speak truth to power, but to use the platforms that they've been afforded to be able to argue for those of us who need their voices heard the most. My work speaks most about education, about state-sanctioned violence in education and how we can topple that idea and that, 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 that pervasive, hyper-violent act. And you know, my work always talks about, and, and, and the contemporary talks about, us looking at the murder of Breonna Taylor and looking at the murder of George Floyd and, and even going backwards or a little further and looking at the murder of Tamir Rice and, and looking at those situations as these sort of like ruptures in this idea of normalcy, but that within the idea of looking at those violent acts as problematic, recognizing the, the violent acts that are in the classroom, like the, the, the pedagogical violence that sometimes goes unnoticed. And so when we talk about this pandemic of COVID-19 and we talk about the pandemic that that pandemic sits within, that is state-sanctioned violence against black bodies, a la George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but also to look at how that plays out in classrooms daily unaddressed. The idea that, um, that the pandemic within the pandemic is state-sanctioned violence and racism, and to understand that that pandemic, that this pandemic sits within, has been ingested by folks in education. That white supremacist ideologies and racist uh, imaginations have been breathed in by academics, even academics of color, and they have become 
they have become um, subject to this, this virus. And, and many of them are asymptomatic, but are still passing it on. That you have black scholars and intellectuals who have breathed in white supremacy. It's been deposited into their bones, into their psyches. It's been deposited into their practices. And they're, insom- they're asymptomatic because they're phenotypically black, but they're still passing on biases against black bodies who don't have a voice to be able to articulate what their version is of black futures. And they are suffering under this punishment that is created by white supremacist structures, but is enacted by, by black bodies who are within academia and within politics, within government. Um, and, and, and so understand that we have to disrupt not just a pandemic of state sanctioned violence as, as it is enacted by police, but that we have to disrupt state sanctioned violence as it is enacted by black scholars, black intellectuals, and black teachers. That the knee on the neck of George Floyd, as he cried out for his mother and said he couldn't breathe, is in many ways analogous to the metaphorical knee on the neck of black bodies in classrooms across the diaspora by black bodies, by black educators, where young folks are saying that they can't breathe because they have no opportunity to be able to imagine black futures in which they are present as they are. That what does a black future for dance hall look like? What does a black future for hip hop look like? What does a black future for black dance and art that exists in underground spaces look like? And how is it that systemic violence, this pandemic of systemic violence that is being passed on by white folks, but black folks as well, making sure that those vernacular forms of black expression can't breathe? And what must we do to, to disrupt that? And I make the argument that the, that the way that we disrupt that is by understanding that first we need to all put in our, our PPE, right? Our protection equipment and our protection equipment is to ensure that we don't catch white supremacy any further and that we heal from it. That if we are to social distance in this moment, if social distancing is essential in a global health crisis that we call a pandemic, then social distancing from white supremacist ideologies in a literal way, but also in a metaphorical way, a la distancing ourselves from ingesting these notions that blackness in its raw forms do not have a place in black futures need to be addressed as well. And so my work in this season and my call in this, in this season is to understand that there are pandemics within pandemics that we must ensure that we do not catch or do not, we not continue to be asymptomatic as we already have ingested white supremacist ideologies in that pandemic. And then as we dismantle systemic racism, we ensure that we social distance from the systems that cause us to be part and parcel of the reinforcing of that racism. And that systemic racism is disrupted only when black and brown bodies within structures that are constructed to ensure that colonial forces maintain themselves on black bodies are dismantled from and separated from that the black academic, the black intellectual, the black scholar starts understanding the need to welcome black ideologies in its most raw form. You know, that I can say in a lecture at UWE or wherever else, that if I don't spit some bars to dismantle systemic racism through my welcoming of, 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 of raw blackness, it doesn't matter. And I can say that the only man better than me is embedded in me. They bury me, but I resurrect so effortlessly. They labeled me, disabled me, and said they saw no changes. They said, Chris, that was from the hood, man. He ain't going to make it. So why we talk about Trump and the way he portrays us, all I can say is look at the media and the way it portrays us, how that phenomenon has so many layers, how the way I look when the camera's on affects the way that they greatest, but I will still be the greatest like Ali. And probably improperly and awkwardly, they had me locked with mediocrity, but that prophecy is pure hypocrisy. They can't stop me when they lock me at a green light. I move on red. And in this season, our work as black scholars and intellectuals is to move on red. That we dismantle systemic racism to move when they say red light, don't go. And then and then at the red light, we go and we go in direction of our communities, in direction of the most marginalized, and in, in, in the direction of the downtown folks, and not always the uptown folks. That we go in the direction of the dance hall and not just the club in a nice neighborhood. That we go in the direction of the Bronx and the hood. And, and, and the South and the dirty and the bottom, that black futures look like embracing blackness in its rawest, most expressive forms in ways they may not fit into the system, but are the only system that we can use to dismantle the existing one. So in black futures and equal rights and dismantling systemic racism, I say the answer is us, but not just us as they formed us to be, but us as we embrace the rawest parts of who we are. And, and embracing the, the, the most ratchet, the most raw, the most unapologetic, the most seemingly violent, but whole and welcoming pieces of who we are is the only way we can dismantle the system that does violence on our bodies, 
there's violence on our souls, and there's, and there's violence on our spirits. If we are to truly breathe as a knee on our neck, we have to love ourselves in our rawest form. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. That was very important, an intervention, as we in the Caribbean space seek to bring some honor and memory to the murder of George Floyd and, of course, the Black Lives Matter protests. Michael, you mentioned the comparative treatment of African countries um, in relation to, to, to um, financial institutions. I'd like you to say a bit more about the comparative treatment of African countries and other countries by financial institutions. One thing that's, uh, when we talk about, you know, borrowing, you know, obviously governments who really want to develop or de deliver uh, development for their people would have to borrow. You know, but the reality is that there are research that have shown that African countries pay more to borrow than Western countries. You know, there is a report by uh, Michael Olabisi and Howard Stein uh, the, so the sovereign, the title is the sovereign bond issues. Do African countries pay more to borrow? You know, and they found that interest rates charged by investors are, high, are higher for sovereign bonds issued by government in sub, -Sub, -Sub Saharan Africa. And um, this explained Africa premium that uh, they, 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 they called it the African premium, premium and essentially it is about 2.9% points after controlling for relevant facts like uh, factors like the period of issue um the credit ratings of issuers and their macroeconomic fundamentals so um a back of according to them a back of the envelope calculation using current debt estimates of 14 billion will suggest that the government of sub-saharan africa would pay roughly 300 million dollars of interest each year that is not readily justified by the risk represented in ratings you know, so with a reasonable discount of about 5% implied half-year coupon payments and average bond tenure of 10 years, they, you know, uh, suggest that this represents a net loss of $2.2 billion to African governments on outstanding obligations. This is crippling. This is money that could be used, better used to serve and lift people out of poverty that has been used you know, uh, in a, you know, been charged to African countries in a lopsided manner. This question is for Anthony Boggs. You know, that reminds me so much of the ways in which Erna Broadba in her paper, Reengineering Black Space, told us that the process of emancipation is yet incomplete. Evidence of which lies in the various iterations of the black abolitionist and the black liberationist movement. What do you see as the most pressing demand we must make now? I think the most pressing demands really are, can be summed up in, in parts of the manifesto that I have just read. One, obviously, in, 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 it, again, there are different demands that have to do with, um, with different countries where, where one is. So that they, in the United States, there's obviously a demand that has to do with questions of the, what we call the carceral state, the ways in which the, the, ways in which the police work. I mean, that's an everyday practice that face black people every single solitary day. So that one has to talk about abolishing this um, and reworking and, 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 doing some, and doing something else um, for, you know, for what one might call public safety and public, and, and public security. But I think it also is about questions of education. It's about questions of uh, housing in the United States. It's about questions of ending the different forms of structural racism. So I think that that for the, in the United States that is a set of demands that needs to ha that needs to happen, and I would also argue in Europe, in France, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, um, that where there are African diaspora populations, that is the, actually the same thing. That there is a question of police, there is a question of um, housing, there is a question of education, but there is also I think very importantly for Afro diaspora populations in Europe, the business of citizenship. What are you? Are you an immigrant, just an outsider, or are you a citizen that then has all the full benefits and rights of citizenship? I would argue that inside, inside post-colonial societies like the Caribbean and in parts of Africa, the actual business of the black, of black liberation is about the transformation of our economies, is about, and, the, and about the transformation of, uh, of the social life of our countries and the actual ending of a certain kind of color and class and sometimes racial oppression 
that ex that that exists amongst ordinary um, ordinary black people. In this, in the end, I, Dr. Naya, one of the things I would argue is that one is that the black liberation movement has always had as its in its radical version has always had as its as one of its ob objectives the re the replacing of capitalist society. You cannot think about the business of racial slavery. You cannot think about uh, modern uh, col um, around about colonialism without thinking about capitalism. And you cannot give up. You need to have. We need to have a different history of capitalism that talks about the relationship. Not in the, not just that um, racial slavery and the slave trade was a platform for capitalism, but that racial slavery and the slave trade and plantation and the plantations economy were in fact capitalism itself. That we quote Sylvia Winter: "The secret of capitalism is not in the factories, but is actually in the plantations." And this, all the things that go in to create the create the plantations. So it would seem to me that in the end, what you are talking about, and my understanding of the black abolitionist movement, or at least the, the radical um, current in it, is that one is thinking about an anti-capitalist, anti-capitalist uh, society. What that will look like, one doesn't know. But I think what you are think what one what is seeing is that there is a release of the political imagination at this point in time. And when that when the political imagination is released, we all don't know what in fact will, will happen. This question is for Kojo, Dr. Kojo Karam. We we are interested in a call to action in the context of this forum. What is the most pressing demand that must be made for change to these legal structures that maintain and reinforce institutional racisms, such as those manifesting the war on drugs? So I will say that the most pressing demand depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, is if you're in a jurisdiction that has not yet started to challenge the current prohibitionist laws and started to engage in drug policy reform, if you're in somewhere like the United Kingdom, we need to be making demands of our politicians and of our representatives to change those laws. These laws are the major pathway through which young black people end up in the criminal justice system. In the United Kingdom, Drugs is the main reason why black people are stopped and searched. It's the number one ground that's given far beyond knife crime or, or, or theft or any of the other crimes. Drugs, suspicion of drugs is number one. You know, it's one of the main drivers to, to which young people end up actually incarcerated in the criminal justice system. And so we need to start by making those demands of our politicians to change those laws. They are not working, they haven't worked, and all they're doing is facilitating the entrance of primarily young black and brown people into the criminal justice system. If you are in a jurisdiction that has started to engage in drug policy reform, so if you are in Canada, or if you are in um, some of the states in the United States of America, or in New Zealand, which is likely to pass it um, in its referendum coming up shortly, um, if you are in those states, then what you need to be doing is putting the question of racial justice front and center. You need to be speaking to your politicians and saying there cannot be a legalization of the cannabis market unless that is accompanied with policies and, frankly, finances that are going to be put back on those communities that have been disproportionately harmed by that, which is black, brown and minority communities. Virin, what do you say to those who assert that opposition and calls to dismantle symbols such as the insignia worn by governor generals with images of saints standing on the necks of devils or monuments to enslavers is just academic hoopla and we should simply accept them as the unfolding of history. What do you say to those people? Well, I say to those persons that you are wrong. When you construct monuments, you are sending a message that these are people to be honored. These are icons. These are people to be emulated. The monuments to enslavers are not monuments that should send any signal that we should emulate these people. These are people who exploited our ancestors and were living with the legacies of that period when these enslavers roamed our spaces. We need to take them down. I am not supporting the view that they should be destroyed because we need the evidence of their crime as we fight for repatriate justice. Let us put them in museum. Let us have proper storyboards. 
and let us tell our children the truth about what they did. And uh, with regard to the, the, the insignia worn by the Governor General, and I don't know if this is, I, I suspect this goes right across the region where we don't have republics. I would say, well, first of all, I'm a bit surprised that the Governor General himself did not realize that he was wearing something offensive. And the larger discussion must start now. Do we need a governor general? Do we need, do we need a living symbol of the monarchy? Because the governor general represents the Queen of England, who is still the head of state of some of the Caribbean countries. It, it, we need to continue this conversation and ensure it's not a 90 wonder. And this is not something for academics and elites. It's not a hoopla. It's a real post-colonial discussion that we should have had a long time ago. Akela, your presentation brought me straight back to my own experience of history. I, could, I couldn't relate to the teaching of history. I found the teaching of history as inadequate for me. I couldn't see myself in that history. But now I've become an advocate of history. Um, like you, with your appreciation for history and various other knowledges, addressing institutionalized racisms, it, it requires some amount of redress in the teaching of history, in the future of Pan-African education. What must, what must we do for this kind of redress? Yeah, I mean, none of this is an accident, right? The, the, in, in, a, in, a, in a Jamaican context, the British-led education system in Jamaica was not designed to bring emancipation, self-confidence, and civilizational direction to Jamaicans of African heritage. That, that education system was designed by British people in Britain's interests. And while it may have been redressed in some ways, and while there may still be, we, we don't need to be emotional about it, there may be things about British civilizational history, British governmental institutions, so on and so forth, that Jamaica, even being a majority African heritage country, chooses to keep. It is not psychologically healthy for people of African heritage in, in Jamaica or Trinidad or Guyana or anywhere in the world to grow up believing stuff that isn't true. It would be different if it was true, but, but the reality that the Kingdom of Benin, for example, it, it, the Great Wall of Benin is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest earthworks carried out prior to the mechanical era. There are three quarters of a million manuscripts surviving from the Library of Timbuktu. There, uh, there is all sorts of philosophical history among the Dogon people or the Igbo people and so on and so forth. Um, to grow up knowing and deliberately being taught nothing or very little of one's own heritage or ancestry, we only need to imagine how British people would react to that if, if, if Britain was colonized by China and then English kids were growing up learning only Chinese civilizational history, as great as China's history is as a, as a civilization, Lao Tzu, Confucius, uh, the water margin, the tear, so on and so forth. China has a long literary history, way, way longer than Britain. Um, how would that be psychologically healthy for British children to be brainwashed against their, their own interests? And so I think that one of the biggest battles against institutionalized racism is this misteaching of history. And one of the fascinating things is when you look at what European colonists actually wrote. So one of my teachers is, is the great scholar Robin Walker. And if you look in the early parts of his book, say when we, when we rule, for example, he, he's got a chapter called The Survey of the Documents. And what, the, what this chapter looks at is the different documents about African history that have survived. And, and when you look at what European explorers, uh, even European colonists, people like Lady Lugard, who was one of the colonizers of Nigeria, what she actually said and what she actually knew about African civilizational history versus what was presented for public consumption um, is night and day. What Italian explorers, there was one Italian explorer whose name escapes me, who went to medieval uh, Aksum in Ethiopia. And he wrote, you know, I'm not even going to tell you the things that I've seen because people back home wouldn't believe him. And if you think of the churches of Lalibela and those incredible architectural works that exist in Ethiopia, it, it, he couldn't even explain to Italians that these people have, have dug They've not built, they've dug a church out of a mountain. And none of that is to say that Africa, it's not a, 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 cultural, uh, uh, a cultural contest in that way necessarily. No one is suggesting that medieval West Africa was as advanced as Renaissance Florence. That's not the argument. Clearly that isn't the case. And, and that doesn't really prove anything because 
London was more advanced than rural Scotland until just the other day. The point is that Africa has its own uh, civilizational history, its own linguistic history, its own philosophical history, and it isn't healthy for people of African heritage, in my view, or even for the world. Dr. Clark talks about African history being the lost pages of human history. It isn't healthy for anybody to grow up believing that an entire continent has made no progress, has had no technological ideas, has not thought about the world in any sort of articulate way. And while, to be fair to professional historians, very few serious historians write that kind of colonial nonsense anymore today, none of it is filtered down into popular culture in the same way. And so a lot of this isn't just about what happens in the academy and what happens in teaching. A lot of this is about African and Caribbean countries having a vision for cultural soft power. So if you think about most people's perception of history, a lot of people's perception of history comes from Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones or any other sort of fantasy and sci-fi and even imagining the past as being exclusively European. So there is a mission there for uh, African and Caribbean governments to see the value of cultural soft power and the value of films, or songs or novels and so on and so forth that, that propagate and share um, share African history and African concepts. You think that you know China has the Confucius Institute, G Germans have the Goethe Institute, Britain has the British Council. So everybody has an agenda for soft power and for spreading their culture and letting people see the, the beauties and the strengths of their culture. To my knowledge, there is not yet that kind of a project, coherent project uh, from a Pan-African perspective. And so I think that's one of the things we should be looking at doing for ourselves, both within the diaspora and in, in the Caribbean and, and Africa itself. You, you talk about soft power. I couldn't have used a better example. The Confucius Institutes tell us a lot about Chinese cultural imperialism, a decision they made many, many years ago, but certainly one that I became publicly aware of through their meetings and, and, and public discourse in 2012. We now need to have an appreciation for this soft power. Countries must have this. There is so much that needs to be done in terms of um, the African diaspora and what it is we must do as people to understand and appreciate the soft power. What, what work on the self must we do to get to the point of understanding this soft power? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Unfortunately, soft power and hard power are related, right? If we think of in our own lifetime, the change in perceptions of India and China. When I was growing up in Britain, people still used to call Indian people the N-word, right? Um, Indian people were not perceived the way they're perceived today. Indian people in Britain today are perceived as, as, I mean, even in school, Indian children in actual measured testing, uh, only Indian and Chinese children are, the ch are assumed to be even more intelligent than they actually are because they do perform better in school than any other ethnic groups in Britain. When you actually look at the way schools assess them, uh, Indian and Chinese kids are assumed to be cleverer even than white children in a majority white country. Um, so even within our lifetime, there's a great book on this called The Chinese Chameleon, which looks at how the perception of China has changed in the West relative to the power relationship between the West and China. And so a lot of the self-hatred that we see in black communities, although it's painful, isn't uniquely black. I mean, if you go to the Philippines, for example, skin bleaching is entirely common. And Filipino people are very light-skinned people, but the legacy of 300 years of Spanish colonialism and a century of American colonialism in the Philippines has left lots of people hating themselves and believing to be white is to be better, to be light is better. So even in mainstream supermarkets in Manila, you will see skin bleaching. Um, so conquered people, we don't like to think of ourselves that way, but, that, but that's what happened. That's how our ancestors ended up in the, in, in the Caribbean in the first place. Um, often have self-hatred. As African and Caribbean countries, I think the two things will grow hand in hand. You know, if Jamaica, Ghana and Nigeria become economically more prosperous, become politically more stable, become more, they'll become more culturally self-confident. If living standards rise, they'll become more culturally self-confident. We, we see that even in my own times, I think, as an overseas Jamaican, going back every year, in a way, you get to see some of the, the jumps for the better, some of the things not always for the better, but, but the jumps for the better more clearly in a way um, than maybe someone who's there constantly. Uh, being in Ghana for the first time over, over New Year's, you, you see some of the things that are heading in the positive direction and, and, and not so much, but I think the two things are not inter, are not separable. I think people can individually work on studying African history. They can work individually on unlearning their colonial conditioning. They can work 
on that within the family, they can work on that within their individual schools and their in individual institutions. But there still is the reality that African and Caribbean states are not as economically prosperous and not as militarily strong as the states of Asia or Western Europe or, um, or, or North America. And as those power relationships change, if they change, then Africa and the Caribbean will be better positioned to propagate soft power. And ironically, then hard power will, will matter less. So I think a lot of this is still to do with the fate of, of nations. And I think Jamaica is in a really unique position because Jamaica has more soft power probably than any poor country in the world. But I don't think it was, in fact, I sincerely doubt it was in any way a result of deliberate, coherent, structured government policy. Reggae music has given Jamaica a presence in the world, along with obviously the recent um, athletic success, but reggae music has given Jamaica a presence in the world. That happened in a way in spite, I would argue, of the Jamaican elite and in spite of some of the colorist and classist attitudes towards reggae music and towards people from the ghetto and so on and so forth. And Jamaica exploded, J J Jamaica consequently, you go anywhere in the world as a, as a Jamaican or even as an overseas Jamaican, and people already know where Jamaica is for a start, as a small island of two million people, two and a half million people, but they have a perception of Jamaica. And, and if there was a more coherent government-led um, initiative or business-led initiatives within Ghana, Jamaica, Nigeria, within the, the, the Pan-African states to openly have a soft power initiative, I was, I'll give one more example on it. I was in Senegal last year and Senegal is the most fitness-obsessed country in the world I've ever been to. Like, imagine Muscle Beach times 10. When you go to the beach in Dakar, there were like literally 10,000 people working out every single day from work finishes at 6 p.m. till like midnight, playing football, doing chin-ups. The government has set up all of these chin-ups, bars all over the beach. Incredibly beautiful, amazing sight. If I were the Minister of Tourism for Senegal, I would have, you know, a marketing campaign, and I had a budget, I'd have a mar marketing campaign, you know, are you as fit as a Senegalese? You have a big picture of a Senegalese wrestler on there, and you saw the way that Thailand has used Muay Thai as a form of cultural soft power, as a, a source of tourist revenue, so on and so forth. Senegal has the opportunity to do so with, with wrestling. Jamaica maybe has the opportunity to do so even more than it is already doing with reggae music and with the great festivals that happen in Jamaica, which... In, in a British context, they're perhaps only even marketed to the Jamaican diaspora. And there's so much more potential for those festivals to be even bigger than they already are. Um, and so I think there also needs to be a sort of coherent policy of, of structured um, soft power, the way that there is for the, more, for the more prosperous states. But I appreciate soft power is not always high on the agenda when, you know, needs still to be met. There are needs that still need to be met within the country that the richer states are, are not worrying about. So richer states obviously have the luxury of having those basics covered in many ways and being able to focus on uh, on, on promoting their cultural world. Chris, oh my goodness. You speak of how those who have been excluded must be made to be included. Reimagining new black futures requires inclusion beyond the black elite. And so you speak of becoming ratchet. Just how ratchet do we need to become? Sister, we need to be as ratchet as possible, even as we infiltrate sanctioned, socially sanctioned spaces of appropriateness. I think many of us who are listening to this, um, you know, we, we, we are of an echelon of folks who have some sort of intellectual capital, perhaps some social capital, um, that we have cultural capital that we oftentimes avoid, but that we embrace the intellectual capital and the institutional capital more. And then those of us who've been afforded the opportunities, the gift, the luck, to be able to enter into these socially sanctioned spaces, we have to enter into these spaces with an unabashed embracing of our most raw selves. And so when I say ration, I mean in dress, in a, an aesthetic and presentation. Folks ask me all the time, you know, why I, I wear the hat. And I say it's, it's part of my re-embracing of my ration. There was a time in American culture where black men had to take off their hat in the presence of white folks to say to them, I see you and I give you power. And it's important for me to enter into academic spaces to wear my hat. It's seemingly, seemingly insignificant, but it's a larger political movement, movement, a larger political movement to say, I'll be so ratchet, I don't take off my hat. And I wear it to the side, cocked a little bit, to call forth that hood sensibility in what I do. That when I play uh, 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 hip hop, when I play, you know, Spraga, or when I play uh, um, Beanie, or when I play Buju, whose new album is brilliant, 
at Columbia University. And usually it's only accepted at volume three. I play at volume 11. And so it's the classroom and it's always folks are uncomfortable. Well, you can't deny that discomfort because that discomfort is my full comfort. And I will no, no longer allow you to be comfortable at the expense of my wholeness and my fullness. And so when I say ratchet, it's ratchet in our intellectual pursuits, but also ratchet in our presentation, in our sound, in our vibe, in our aesthetic, in our culture, in our spirituality, that we no longer tuck pieces of ourselves uh, and, and say, let's not do that to make the system comfortable, but wear all of it fully and wholly so that we can also signal to our folks who are out in the trenches, who are out in, in a metaphorical trench sounds, that they can infiltrate these spaces as well, and that these spaces are, are for them and not just for the elite. So the work is continuous. It is, it is a never-ending job. We work in institutions that also need to be held accountable for the way they can impact black lives. We teach courses. We're interacting with students. How do we begin to hold our institutions accountable? I, I, I won't even, I, that was a question I know, and I can't respond to it because as you always do, um, you wow me with your insight and, and, your, and your intelligence and, and your call to action. Because you're right, we can't make the argument that black lives matter when only some black lives matter. And when education and educational spaces and institutions of higher education oftentimes become the mechanism through which black lives truly don't matter. So yes, we, we have to hold our institutions accountable and we have to work in and with them to not just reimagine, but dismantle institutions that advocate for post-colonial thought who operate within post-colonial tradition. To, to question the hypocrisy in the articulation of a post-colonial framework and the endorsing and the holding up of that ideology. We have to hold ourselves to task. As you mentioned that, I am recalling the words from Alice Walker, we are who we have been waiting for. There is no Messiah or anyone else coming to save us. Um, we have to be able to do what we need to move forward with our countries and our societies. And, you know, this is why we can't talk. This conversation never ends. And I think keep all of this, keep all of this as you share with folks, please don't cut it off short because I think that, that this is the beauty and the magic of when we connect, right? Like, and, and you said Alice Walker and that spoke to my soul and, I to, and it immediately went to France Fanon who, who we've never fully embraced the scholars. We cite him, we quote him, but we don't embrace his philosophy and, our, and what we do. And in this world I am in, I am always creating myself. And in our creation of ourselves, it has to be in an anti-colonial, anti-racist, and, 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 and ensuring that we, we continue to have a, a, a disruption of anti-blackness in our thought. So for, from Frass Fanon to Maxine Green to Alice Walker, these folks have laid for us the path. And in this season, we must follow. We began with words from Peter Tosh's Equal Rights. We set out to not just talk, not to be among elites, but to share knowledge. It is incumbent upon us as an institution, the University of the West Indies, to make knowledge available, to have discourse, but also to call people to act. I want to thank all of you who have taken the time to be with us. I want to thank the team at UWI TV. I want to also thank those in the Institute of Caribbean Studies who have been a tower of support to those who answered to the call to move in this direction to host this global forum. I want to thank the Office of the Vice Chancellor, particularly um, Vice Chancellor Beckles himself and Professor uh, Richard Bernal, who were very much able to respond immediately to the call to move ahead with this global forum. This is one moment in our history when we pause to reflect on the fact that the struggle is also a Caribbean struggle and that we have quite a lot of work to do ourselves at home in these countries where peoples of African descent continue to live and have their being. Thank you very much all, walk good.